Wow, Gersh. Hey, Gersh. Midday stream. Break a hundred, hundred viewers. comes a moment of destiny, and this nation again and again in the great hours of its fate has swept aside convention, has swept aside the little men of talk and of delay, and have decided to follow men and movement, for there we go forward to action, the let who dare follow us in this hour. That is the permanent, the mighty mood of Britain. And I claim that in the ranks of our black shirt legions, much and mighty ghosts of England's past, and their strong arms around us, and their voices echo down the ages, saying onward. Well, hey guys, it's me. It's me, Ryan. So end of my little uh at the end of my little opening monologue which will be i don't know it'll be like an hour like an hour or so uh i've got some cool activities for all of you that was mosley that was oswald mosley that was just a little clip from one of his speeches his more fiery speeches the british union of fascists is what he was a uh, head of so this stream will be about uh, religion again. It's something that I'm obsessed with. <laughs> I'm not actually gonna be beard guard. I, I that that was that was a trick. That was just a trick to get you to click on the stream, guys. Um, we talk about religion again because it's something I'm obsessed with because I think it's the key. British Union of Chuds. Who made this fan art? I don't know. I don't know who made it. It's pretty, pretty, pretty detailed, huh? Pretty, pretty detailed, uh, detailed art. Um. So one. I want drama. Uh, want drama. Well, I, the problem is, guys. You say you want the drama. I don't know enough about the drama. I don't know. Uh, the things I don't know enough about big tech and, and and things like that. 
Do not mess with Paul Town. This is your final warning. I know he'll do like a like a twenty seven hour stream, and it'll be like some epic event or something. If I ever if I ever say anything like truly mean about Paul Town, like he'll 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 take another hit of whatever it is he's on. I just go on for days. Holy shit. Um. So, <laughs> one major problem that. <laughs> How do you break? Well, you're not going to break destiny out of out of the progressive religion. You're not going to break him out because he's he's too he's too publicly committed to it. Too publicly committed. So one major problem with the decline of the belief in spirits, ghosts, deities, is that it has somehow led many who reject those things to believe they have sort of overcome religion itself right they believe that because they no longer believe in 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 the in the ghosts in the spirit in the god that they have they have overcome what they have overcome religion in essence and you know this shouldn't be need stating but sadly sometimes sometimes it does religion even in, in its original understanding religion was never contingent on some sort of deity on some sort of god um two examples that i bring up because i can't really be arsed to look too much deeply in, in, into it because i i know there's more but there's just two examples buddhism and taoism buddhism and taoism um now, before any like peanut gallery starts bringing up various mystical beliefs that Buddhism or Taoism have, or any other non-theistic religion you might know about, just a litmus test. Does the religion invoke a deity to define morality? Right. You can believe in ghosts and spirits. You could even believe in some sort of afterlife or reincarnation, but that doesn't mean those ghosts or spirits either have special knowledge or some sort of divine morality. Um, and as an aside, there's something that I thought about. This also calls into question whether the ancient Greek pantheon could, like, truly be considered a religion. Because if one believes that, like, by doing certain things or sacrificing to a god or gods, <laughs> that they will gain favor, you know, like rain... Good harvest, fertility. Oh, I got, I got a chat. I will read all donos, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna disrupt the flow, so to speak. What little flow I have for the donos, just so people know. Um, but but yes, I will read all donos, just not at the moment they're they're sent. Um, that text is really small on <laughs> the dono bar. Um, but yeah, uh, the belief in the Greek pantheon that just because a belief that a god will provide certain things for you that's not really a theistic religion in the sense that say christianity or islam is really a theistic religion right um cuz it's not really a theistic religion unless they subs unless they ascribe some sort of moral truth to poseidon or zeus or whatever Otherwise, they just happen to believe in an entity that is, and they're making sort of a, a trade with it. They believe in an entity that's really powerful, and they're making some sort of trade with that entity. They're making a sacrifice to this god to get things from the god. That's it. It's it's just it's just a kind it's just a kind of material. It's n not material in like the corporeal sense, but it's a kind of you know mechanistic exchange. You know, and that's not to say. That's not to say society's lives won't be driven to some extent by what they think the gods want. In fact, their behavior may actually be more modified by the gods than someone who follows a truly theistic religion, like Christianity or Islam. So, like, but the thing is, I would call the Greeks non-religious theists, right? Um, for a non-religious theist who believes in a god, but they don't ascribe any, it's not a religious belief in Zeus. For example, they don't ascribe any moral truth to what Zeus has to say, just power. They're more like a fish being driven by a current. They don't necessarily ascribe any moral truth to that current. It's just the will of the gods and nothing more, right? Um, and so in this way, the real religions of classical Greece were not the belief in or appeasement of the gods, but the philosophies. 
right? The philosophies were the real religion. Like the philosophies, without having any kind of powerful deity to incur, you know, favor or avoid the wrath of, you know, they could only carry any force if they were earnestly believed unto itself. Like, I follow this philosophy because it is true. That's religion, right? Not, you know, I'm going to appease Zeus because he might zap me or something, you know? That's that's just avoiding, you know, some sort of perceived negative consequence, right? You, you believe Zeus is real and you believe he could do bad things to you, so you appease him. That's not really a religion. That's just a belief in something that, in my opinion, doesn't exist. I don't want to offend the Zeus believers in the chat, but... Um, or people who deny, or people who who are skeptics that the top of Mount Olympus was ever reached. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't. I, 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 you know, I I, I want to respect any anybody who may happen to believe in, in Zeus and Poseidon. But uh, but I, I'm just saying I personally don't believe. Holy moly! Okay, I need to read the chats because somebody's giving me uh, bucks right now. Okay, let me let me. Let me uh... Holy shit! Okay. Um, Let's see. Where are we? Where are we? Reading the chats. Uh, best 10... Okay, I'll read them in order. $10 from Best Dressed Guest. Glad to see you streaming again, friend. Also, I saw you in the Dawson stream chat, you cheeky bugger. Very cheeky of me to have the audacity to be in the Dawson stream chat. That's pretty, uh, pretty cheeky of me <laughs> to, to be in chats of other streams. Uh... So, yes, thank you, Best Dress Guest. $5 from Ganon Burr, B-U-H-R. Thank you for the years of insightful content. Glad you're on Cozy. Cozy is a great place. It's a great site. Nick has uh, has created a, a wonderful platform. And it has been my uh, decision that it is in my best interest to become a vassal under the, the Fuentes Empire. I'm a, I am a Fuentes vassal on his on his site. Twenty dollars from Ober from from Supersburg, Obersburg. Sup, Ryan? What should hardcore NS guys, what most of us would call glowies, but actual sincere guys, do instead of LARP as terrorists? Um, you should do what I'm going to talk about towards the end of my monologue on this thing. Um. It's interesting you asked that question, but basically, sort of towards the end, I actually began to sort of answer. And I ha and and to all my my little black angels, uh, I actually have a Discord set up. I'm not going to link to it now because I've just set it up, and I don't want people going in while I'm. Uh, but at the end of this, I'm going to set up a, a, a. I have a Discord channel for for the straight ops for these heterosexual ops that uh that, that I want to talk about later. Anyway. 7274, just a fanboy on the internet. Do you have plan on having a, a wife slash kids? Um I need some money. I need I need more money than I currently have. And and part of getting more money is being more regular on, on the streaming. But anyway, uh for uh that that is a lot of money from uh uh just a fanboy on the internet. $72.74. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is uh, a <laughs> that is quite a dono. Um uh if if you have a username, I I will be willing to talk about more things. It's unfortunate that you that you spent that much money on a personal question. I don't really like to answer uh, personal questions. Uh but since you donated so much money, uh if you have something else you want to ask about and uh then, then feel free to do so. Anyway, um, okay. So where was I in in my in my opening monologue? So spirituality, spirituality is distinct from religion. That it's not the same. Um, it may be easier to understand if we look at say like Marxism. Like Marxism is clearly a non-theistic religion, right? You 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 have like the promise of heaven, the threat of hell, the great journey to heaven, the and the. And most importantly, the absolute sense of morality, right? The absolute sense of morality. And what that does, right? The thing about, like, religions is, like, you basically know them when you see them. And 
you, you know, we could come up. I, I know that there's there may be a lot of people who are cri are critics of what I'm what I'm saying on this, who may want some like really, you know, cross T dotted I, you know, analytic definition of religion. But I don't think that's particularly useful, and I don't think that's it's particularly needed. Uh, I don't think it'd be particularly useful because you'd always find some sort of exception to an explicit definition, and it's not particularly needed because it's like it's like pornography. You you know it when you see it. You know, it's like is that is that artistic nudity or is that pornography? Well, let's try to come up. If you come up with some explicit definition, then it's you know, you're just gonna have violations of that definition with things that are clearly pornography, or in, in this case, things that clearly are religion. And so I don't find a, a, an explicit definition to be meaningful. But the thing is, if you look at, like, Marxism is clearly a religion, right? It has all the hallmarks of religion, just the, the art, the way they speak, the certainty, the the, the path, right? And, and, and what's typical in religion is that there is a road to heaven and, the, and a threat of hell. There's some sort of heaven, some sort of hell, right? Like with Marxism, the heaven is stateless communism somewhere over the rainbow. Hell is super terrible capitalist exploitation. Oh, but don't worry. Satan is bound to lose. So the capitalists are bound to lose. It's scientific. It's a scientific advancement to civil, of civilization through the dictatorship of the proletariat to ultimately the, the stateless communist society. And... And so there's kind of... A, and so there's a Satan figure, but it's certain that he will lose. Right? There, there's the capitalism, but it's certain that capitalism will, will fail. Right? It, 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 follow, it follows the pattern of religions. And Marxism... Marxism actually came about from a... Uh, from... Well, Marxism was, came about late 19th century, but the intellectual origins of Marxism was from an 18th century spiritual family. Um, and this sort of, uh, kind of, kind of scholastic mystic, um, family of thought was known as economics, economics. It's sort of this esoteric mysticism known as economics. Um, and there's still a bunch of them running around today, uh, and causing all sorts of havoc on, on, on people. Um, now these people who believed in economics, they don't believe in spirits in like the ancient sense of like non-corporeal beings, but more like a set of theorems determining mass behavior, like an invisible hand. Um, now, modern economics has sort of evolved from this and moved towards being more of an empirical study of human behavior regarding material acquisition, kind of a um, a a an inferior version of psycho of quantitative psychology. Psycho there's basically two psychologies for people who don't know. There's uh, bullshit psychology, right? Which which what a lot of people think of when they say psychology is crap. They're thinking about like, for example, the kind of psychology that psychotherapy comes from, right? Which is or psychiatry comes from. So there's crap psychology. And there's quantitative psychology. It's it's really two two entirely different disciplines, right? There's one psychology where we get uh, things like IQ, IQ studies, which is rigorous, you know, follows all sorts of you know, um, quote unquote scientific conventions. And then there's uh, let's just make stuff up, <laughs> you know. So it, it really is two pretty discrete halves, like quantitative. There's basic quantitative psychology, and then there's woo. And economics is kind of like a low rent version of uh, quantitative psychology, like like a much grosser and inferior version of quantitative psychology. Um, so now Marxism and and the Austrian school of economics, I would say those two things, Marxism and the Austrians, they are they remain closer to the original sort of um secular spiritual roots of quote of of the original um economic mystics now does this mean economics is a religion 
No, of course not. Economics is not a religion. In the same way, beliefs in ghosts or beliefs in spirits or beliefs in magical forces, that is not a religion. That does not constitute a religion. Now, one can, one can make a religion based on economics, Marxism, libertarianism, for example, what, what I would consider religions based on economics, just as you can make a religion based on spirits, based on non-corporeal beings, such as the Abrahamic religions, right? So spiritual things can be the basis of religion, but not necessarily. For example, in ancient Greece, they had the Greek pantheon. They believed in all sorts of gods, but that did not constitute the basis of religion. Similarly, people can believe in economics, but it doesn't necessarily constitute the basis of a religion. Whereas in Marxism and libertarianism, clearly economics is sort of the basis of the religion. Right? So that, that, that's sort of an, ana an analogy, that spirituality and beliefs in deities does not, e does not necessarily equal religion unless you ascribe some sort of moral force and typically like an like a arc of inevitable progress, you know, to it, which libertarianism does less than Marxism. But even libertar libertarians kind of have a, uh, tend to have a providential sort of thinking, like, like the idea that there's going to be some great libertarian moment and the advancement of society is a, is a long march towards liberty, you know, um, the kind of inevitableism that you get from from religions. Um, I, it's definitely not as strong as in Marxism, but it's certainly there. Um, and the more purest of, of libertarians that you get, where you get to like uh, anarcho capitalists, um, these obviously they're they are like the most inevitableists that believe that society will eventually um, do do away with the state. Um, kind of kind of like Marxism believes that they'll do away with the state, although I think that the libertarians have a more, uh, the, the, the anarcho-capitalists have a much more grounded idea of what the world would look like in the absence of a state, because they actually try to solve real, like, like they actually try to answer questions like, how will you privatize the roads? How will you deal with land ownership? How will you fund the military? How will, you know, disputes be resolved in the absence of a central lawmaking authority, right? Anarcho-capitalists actually try to solve that and try to bring up like empirical examples of these things being done, you know, typically in isolation, right? The thing is the stateless society has not been proven to exist altogether, but like elements, like each element in isolation has sort of been proof of the, of the stateless society has been proven. So I'd say ANCAPs are definitely more grounded than Marxists. Um, but it's, it's, it's still sort of a providential thinking. Um, and a lot of the criticisms against ANCAPs, like, well, how you solve, like there's, they actually have answers to that. And I, and back when I was like, I didn't consider myself like set on like libertarian property principles or morals or, or opposition to any kind of, you know, uh, pseudo taxation. Like I wasn't really committed to the capitalist side of anarcho-capitalism. I wasn't really committed to any particular model. Um, but yeah, I just remember like, yeah, like they have a lot of answers to these things. And and I actually believe I came up with some, some answers um, that have since been cribbed by people with, with greater credentials um, and, and not, not having given me any credit for it. Anyway, um, so what else will I go? Let's talk about. Yeah, so I get I I need to follow my notes, otherwise the stream is going to be ten hours. So now before continuing, um, someone who is uh, skeptical of how I'm what I'm referring to as religion that that where I basically don't take the theistic thing as too important of a of a moniker for religion. They may be going, well, you're just defining religion as something that bridges the isot gap. The Izot Gap. I don't know if you've seen it. It's pretty big. I think it's somewhere in Colorado or something. Um, so the Izot Gap. Um, if this is your thought, like, I disagree because I don't respect the Izot Gap because reality doesn't respect the Izot Gap. Reality doesn't care about the Izot Gap. Um, clearly, like in, in like Christianity, and by Christianity, I mean real Christianity. Right, people who actually 
believe it, right? People who you would call like fundies or people or, or most people from the year 1100 AD in, in Central Europe. Um, like the Izot gap is bridged, right? God wills it like God wills it. So it ought to be done. The end, the end. And if you want to say, oh, but that doesn't philosophically, just because some entity desires it, that doesn't bridge the Izot gap. The Izot gap can't be bridged. No, he just wills it. And people accept that as bridging the Izod gap. The end. Like, you don't, you know, you, you can play like philosophical games where you say that, yeah, yeah, I mean, sure, sure. There's, there is no like analytically correct argument that you can bridge the Izod gap. You know, Ran tried to do it with like Eudaimonia or something, but like, who cares? Like in reality, people don't actually have a problem with the Izod gap. They believe some religion and that bridges it. The end. Um, Nobody cares. Now, among, among Marxists, um, they have some sort of formula for surplus value, right? How that happens to be exploitation. You know, value, value comes from labor, but the mud pies argument doesn't refute it because socially necessary labor time, blah, 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 blah. And let's say that's all true. Um, let's say that, you know, the, the Marxist sort of exploitation formulas are all true. It doesn't analytically follow that one ought to stop this oppression. But in practice, if you went to Russia in 1926 and you admonished some Russian intellectual in 1926 that Marx was merely describing exploitation and that by failing to analytically bridge the Izot gap, he never implied anything should be done about it. Right, at least not in capital, though in manifesto he was a bit more more normative. Right, all those Russians around you, they would they would just look at you kind of weirdly. And they'd say, like, whatever the equivalent of 1926 Russia would be, like, cool story, bro. Nobody cares about the Izod gap. So, and you can say, like, a description of spirits or gods doesn't necessarily give those spirits or gods moral force. You know, it is only when people give the spirits or gods moral force that we can say it's a theistic religion. Um, what was I saying? I lost my train of thought like okay so like if one merely believes that we must sacrifice so that the sun will continue to rise like that may be a compelling reason to do some very gruesome things um but that does not imply moral truth to the act necessarily though practically speaking it could right you know the aztecs could come to believe that it is the morally right thing to sacrifice people to the sun god you know even though there is like a like a motivation that you want you want the sun to continue to rise, so you have to sacrifice people so the sun keeps rising. Um, but over time, they could come to believe that is a morally good thing in and of itself. You know, so um, and like it really depends on how the Aztecs feel. Do they say after a generation of sacrificing um, not Aztecs but other tribes tend to tend to tend to have the honor of being the sacrifice. After a generation of sacrificing uh, members of other tribes to the sun god, do they feel that it's morally correct to make such sacrifices? If so, then yeah, then it is. Then it has become a theistic religion, right? And it's it's not just a misguided understanding of the universe. Then it really is a, a, a theistic religion, you know? Now, if the Aztecs feel that the sacrifices are wrong, and what a sorry state of affairs it is that, that they have to kill so many people to keep the sun rising. That would clearly not be a religion, but that would just be a faulty understanding of the universe. Right? You know, which isn't to say that even people who are um, non-religious theists, right, they believe they have to make sacrifices to a god. It's, it's not to say that they wouldn't be hostile if you told them they were wrong and they didn't need to sacrifice anyone, like let's say you went out and you killed a hundred people and you killed a hundred people in the belief that it would prevent a zombie apocalypse. Like I got to kill these people. Uh, Cause if I don't, there'll be a zombie apocalypse. And then some guy comes up to you and says, Hey, you know what? Um, you're in error. You are in error. Uh, there, there won't be a zombie apocalypse and it, and it, whether or not you kill a hundred people. Right, if you're told that after you had already killed those hundred people, well, that might be kind of a hard pill for you to swallow, right? Um, 
even if you don't ascribe any objective moral truth to what you're doing, you know, just that you thought that you were doing sort of the right thing in a, you know, more personal colloquial sense. So, okay, what else? Religious feeling. Okay. So, in the evolution of warfare, let me get my mic a little bit closer. Um, yeah, okay. In the evolution of warfare, there was a time from around 1850 to 1900. Um, this was sort of ongoing during the American Civil War, which is why the U.S. Civil War had like this weird hybrid of what's called uh, open order and closed order uh, combat. Um, there's a time from about 1850 to 1900 called the Open Order Revolution. Like in ancient warfare, troops would stand close together, shoulder to shoulder, in closed ranks, mutually supporting each other, fighting across long lines, right? Because if you didn't fight that way, you would just be picked off sort of individually. So you had to have, you know, there would be skirmishers, there'd be flankers, there'd be archers, sometimes even like heavy artillery. Um, but these things were mostly ways of influencing what was going to happen when the big bodies of men with spears and sometimes, you know, um, some type of, of gladius or sword, right? The, 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 the the battle was was determined by what happened when the big blocks of basically melee infantry hit into each other. Everything else was kind of about influencing that ultimate engagement when the big blocks of melee infantry hit each other. Um, but as firepower increased, you know, a packed column of men standing shoulder to shoulder you know, that was nothing more than like a really easy target. And so formations had to start spreading out as you started to get more and more firepower on the battlefield until you got to a point where they stopped really being formations in the field at all. Like the terminology remains, right? We, t we still talk about army formations, but they're formations in a more abstract sense. They're not, when they go out into fighting, they're not in like a formation. Okay. Um, and I think the internet is sort of the same, has, has done the same thing for religions, right? Since now everyone has a platform, anyone can say things, and any criticism can be signal boosted. It's that's similar to everyone having a repeating rifle, right? And so these kinds of traditional, concrete, named religions, they have a much harder time getting off the ground, right? As soon as you give a movement a name, it becomes a target. Now, for description's sake, you know, everything is given sort of a broad name, like, oh, a liberal, a conservative, right? These are sort of broad umbrellas. But things like objectivism or Marxism, um, these would be very, much more difficult to come about today, right? And I think what happened when, in, the, in, the, in the 90s, you had... Um, a lot of uh, minor theistic cults or minor theistic religions called pejoratively called cults and they had all and th they have had a really hard time as soon as the internet started becoming big uh, because those are things that have a really hard time surviving a high firepower environment christianity itself had a hard time ha is having a very hard time in the high firepower environment of the internet and um but christianity just has so much legacy bulk that it's obviously been able to survive a lot better than things like scientology for example um but the thing is this new high firepower environment dictates the kinds of religions that will come to predominate today right um so the first thing is that an, a religion of today cannot be theistic it can't be theistic right there's too much knowledge about the heavens and the depths or at least perceived knowledge right people believe things about them right and and no gods found um too many previously unexplained phenomena are now explained so not only is the so, so that creates sort of the idea that everything is ultimately explainable in mechanistic terms right um not that all mechanistic explanations are correct, erroneously called scientific explanations, but they're really mechanistic explanations. Um, 
but that the masses believe them to be generally correct, or at least good enough to where they don't need to invoke some sort of non-corporeal explanation. Uh, what's the second thing? Second. Oh, the second thing is that the doctrine has to be open order. Right, like take global warming or climate change as, as it's been rebranded. So while global warming is in a sort of gray area of being a, a religion versus just like an urgent material concern. No, and no, I'm not speaking to the truth or falsity of the propositions of the global warming movement. Um, but the thing is, that's the kind of, like the global warming movement is the kind of thing that can survive in a high firepower environment, right? Because the corpus, right, the sort of intellectual backing of the global warming movement, it's an infinity of journal articles that very few people have read. Even, like even the writers of such articles have only themselves read a fraction of the, of the literature that exists on global warming stuff. Even fewer understand, you know, and of course there's unnecessary obscuritanism in journal articles as I talked about before. And, and you know, and if you, and of course I've wrote, basically written, I'd call it a book. It's like 60 something word print pages. It's, basically a book that I show that just because something's published in a journal does not, and, and just because it's published in a, in a journal and it's obscure to this language that you can't understand, it does not mean it can be replicated or is accurate or anything like that. Uh, oh, at the end of this, I, I um, the house of Wagner found an amazing article on, um, on papers being on the kinds of papers that get published. So I'll talk about that after, after this. Um, but yeah, so like Marxism or Christianity, for example, or even a minor religion like objectivism, they have a corpus. Uh, now the corpus may be large, right? The Bible's pretty big. Das Kapital is pretty big. Um, Rand's book, book collection is pretty big. Um, but they comprise a central corpus and you can read that corpus, and that is objectivism, Marxism, Christianity, Islam, whatever. And thus, it's easier to get to grips with it. It's not some arduous process to so much as define what the hell it is you're looking at. Right? Objectivism, Marxism, Christianity, Islam, these are closed order. Right? Glo and Whereas global warming, the global warming movement, whether it's a religion or not, it is an open order movement, right? Basically, global warming, it is fundamentally impossible to completely come to grips with. Um, now, I think you can come to grips with it somewhat. You can sort of understand the basic arguments that, of like you don't for po CO2 and, po and positive feedback effects leads to runaway global temperature increases, right? It's based on... It, Basically, the, 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 the big big AGW is based on positive feedbacks, right? And so the whole debate isn't about the direct forcing of CO2. Everyone knows CO2 is a greenhouse gas. And those surveys that say that like 90-something percent believe in global warming, what the, basically what they're saying is that they recognize that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Everyone, so yeah, sure, whatever. Right? But the question is, are the feedback effects of an increase in temperature of the planet Earth, are they are they is it a positive feedback or is it a negative feedback? I personally believe that since the planet Earth has been around for as long as it's been around, it's probably a negative feedback, right? Because if it was a positive feedback, then, you know, there have been events in the past Earth's history where temperatures have increased and never has it led to a runaway greenhouse effect. So my bias is towards a negative feedback system, <laughs> which is why we're still here. Um but uh so i will say that i am not happy about this development because i'm not happy about the the fact that things all now have to be open order um because open order movements suck they're messy they're harder to control they're harder to attack but given things like Reddit exist and like Vox exists, you have to spread out your movement under a vague umbrella lest you be sort of vaporized by a million and one 
you know, debunkings and refutations and all that crap. Um, let me see. Do I have any more? Do I have any more white power chats? Let's see. Let's see if we have, have some white power chats here. Uh, yes. Okay. Let me, let me, um, okay. We have some more white power chats. Okay. $5 from username 371. Bronsky's book validated everything I suspected as a teenager. Middle school girls and my mom had the exact same mannerisms, but with low IQ. <laughs> okay. Uh, $3 from Sage. I think it is weird you went on a tirade against Moldbug when everything you say he would agree with or even stated himself before. Maybe you dislike his writing style and that's fine, but I don't think it's worthless. He uses many first-hand sources. Well, okay. I really don't like his writing style. Like, I really don't like his writing style. And I really don't like the fact that he treats... Like, like, so, like the things that I'm saying on stream here, which is sort of, like, almost, like, somewhat extemporaneous, like, going off of notes, that... <sighs> Yeah, he uses some first-hand sources, but, but, okay, um, you can go to my Telegram, and there is a, a document called Leaving the Cathedral. Um, that's not, it's still a working title. I need to come up with a real title, because the title, I think, sucks. Uh, but, like, like, compare that to, like, anything Moldbug's written. It's not, it's not the same. You know, or, or look at look at. Um, I also had a thing called on the uh, perception of oppression. Like, just M Moldbug doesn't do the work necessarily to evidence this thing. And what I don't like is the idea that I'm going to evidence what Moldbug just asserted, and then people will go, "Oh, Moldbug vindicated." Like, when Moldbug himself wasn't the first to say any of the things that he's asserting. Right? There are people before Moldbug who have asserted what Moldbug has said. Right. And then Moldbug said them again. And then people, me and people like me, actually provide the, the, the requisite evidence of it. And then, and then suddenly this, this, this guy um, is, is somehow getting the credit for these ideas that are not original to him. Right? He, he, he didn't come up with these ideas, and he didn't provide the hard evidence required to persuade intransigent people of them. Okay, anyway. $3 from Redcoat. What are your thoughts on Keith Woods? Um, in general, I think he does good work. Um, I don't watch a whole lot of his stuff. I saw his uh, thing on the environmental thing on Michael Moore's documentary and him shitting on, basically Keith Woods shitting on shit libs for getting mad at Michael Moore for saying that the environmental movement is largely a, a scam. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, yeah, I don't know enough about Keith Woods to have a particularly strong opinion. What I've seen of his work has been um, good um, in general. Uh, I know you're anti-philosophy, but isn't your analysis of the institutional nexus basically a foray into epistemology? Yeah, it, okay, sure. Um, it, it's... It is epistemology, but it's epistemology in a much more day-to-day -day sense, right? It's not epistemology in the sense of, like, okay. It's not epistemology in the way most philosophers... Like, if, if you take a course on epistemology, they're going to... They are much more, I guess for lack of a better term analytic and what they're talking about when they talk about epistemology. What I'm talking about is like who you believe. I'm, I'm basically talking about like at every place in time in human history, there are the truth towers and people tend to believe the truth towers. And we have to say that like, there's no truth in the truth towers. That, that's so it's not really epistemology in the way most like formal philosophers talk about it. Um, wouldn't you benefit from reading what others have to say? 
Yes. No. Maybe. Uh, I don't think... I used to read about philosophy more. I used to be in, like... Like, I used to be more into philosophy. And... I lost interest. I became disappointed. Now, if some of the things that I'm saying about like the institutional nexus fall under the rubric of quote unquote philosophy, now you could you could be a, a, a prick about it and say, well, every philosophy is just the study of knowledge. So typically, so so actually, anything you do is philosophy. You know, you could say that, and that's like that's kind of a trivial truth, <laughs> but. But it's it's not really what people mean when they say philosophy. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think I would have much benefit from reading about like academic epistemology stuff. Uh, anyway, three dollars from Hater Time. How much credit does one deserve for coming to the correct conclusion later when all the information was available to start? For example. Destiny's feelings on censorship after all his enemies are already to platform. I think Destiny's feelings on censorship came after he was kicked off of Twitch. So, yeah, I don't, I, yeah. Like, having the correct, like, yeah, I mean, it's like having the correct, like, I mean, having the correct opinion after the consequence of the wrong opinion has already happened is... You know, it's, I mean, it, it's it's trivial. What that basically means is that you didn't have the correct opinion. Now, in Destiny's in Destiny's set position, it's a, a little bit different. Um, because obviously he's crying about censorship after he got he got censored, and he didn't even need to get fully censored. He still has like full access to YouTube, whereas I have to sort of play cat and mouse with YouTube streams. Um, which makes it, which means I can't build the channel. And obviously I don't have access to the algorithm in the same way someone like Destiny does. So like, I, I mean, yeah, obviously he's crying. He's either crying crocodile tears or he's suddenly like mad when it, when it finally happens to him. Okay. Um, so back to what what the what the an effective religion has to be today. So number three. So I talked about the first two. One was the doctrine must be open order. Um, the doctrine cannot be theistic. And the third thing is that the doctrine has to be quote unquote science. Um, and this is something that actually goes as far back as the cathedral schools around 600 AD. This is not a new thing at all. Um, like Marxism had to present itself as quote unquote science. And Christianity presented itself as, as, as a kind of natural philosophy, right? And the way this is done in practice is that you put religion right next to the physical sciences. In the Soviet Union, you know, they have, ta they have, they have courses on Marxist theory, right, in, in the same universities that, on, in which they have engineering schools, right? So the actual material stuff is next to the religion, right? And they're put on the same campus, Right. You know, um, like in a medieval cathedral school, you, you could typically get a course in you could take courses in medicine, natural philosophy and natural philosophy is like what we would call, quote unquote, science, uh, law or theology. Theology is thus uttered in the same breath as medicine and natural philosophy, just as social science or, you know, Black studies is right next to the actual, what we might call actual science. I wouldn't call it actual science; I'd call it mechanism. But whatever, you know, you know what I mean. It's right. Social science, quote unquote, is right next to actual science in the truth in the truth towers. And today, the truth towers are, are called universities. And even the term university—that's a holdover from. Catholic, Catholic, which means universal, right? That's that's where it comes from, and even things. And and I was at like the term professor. That's that's like the term professor. It sounds like confessor. It sounds. It always sounded like vaguely, you know, 
Christian. Like professor seems like a Christian thing. And yeah, it turns out it is. The term professor was always, you know, goes all the way back to the origins of the cathedral school. And even the the move of universities from being like strictly basically what happened is all the cathedral schools they didn't go away what happened is that the the core religion that was taught went from being theology to being you know social science they didn't disappear right like oxford still exists harvard still exists right harvard originally was like the was like the old cathedral schools right you, they had theology and then they had a whole bunch of of um of natural philosophy they had natural philosophy medicine and law now, Harvard was originally that way. Over time, Harvard, so so Harvard didn't like stop existing. It's not like Harvard was replaced by a, you know, a secular university. No, Harvard just became a secular, like the religion just changed at Harvard, right? So in a sense, so what people will, will say is that the, the universities have replaced the function of, of the church. I go further than that. I say, no, the church just never left. It's literally the same institution, right? Things like Harvard and Oxford and the University of Paris, like they're still, they are what they were since their founding. It's just the religious doctrine changed, in, you know? Um, and the thing is going back to like or, what I was saying before, previous streams about organizations, this doesn't need to be some grand conspiracy for this to happen. Nobody needs to be planning any of this. It's simply that organizations and, and a religion is a kind of organization or movement that those organizations that do things that work win out over organizations and movements that don't do things that work. So without any one person understanding optimal strategy, optimal strategy wins out eventually over time until you get to the final thing that appears as if it's some well-crafted thought control program, right? That's what it, it looks like. It, it, it really looks like it's, it's a well-designed thought control program, but it's not, right? It's, it's just evolution in all things is what it is. So yeah, that's, uh, that's that. Uh, what else? What else do I have in my notes here? Okay. Does it look like we're on the optimal strategy to anybody? No. Uh, religions that work. Religions that work. Um, so moving away from religions, there's a certain religious messaging that works. Uh, the first is carrot and stick, or like heaven and hell. Uh, again, Marxist. Heaven is like the heaven analogs, like stateless communism. The end of the workers' dictatorship. Hell will be the unending capitalist exploitation. Ironically, given that Marxism is far less popular than it was uh, in the United States in 1920s and 1930s, uh, like the modern U.S. economy is actually closer to resembling like Marx's hell, even though there are far fewer Marxists back in the 20s when the U.S. was much less like Marx's hell. Um, Right, because in the U.S. you're having increases in productivity, but you're not getting increases in wages, increases in real wages, which is why, like, I mean, I mean, you've all seen like the the fact that somebody, you know, in the, in the 1980s could get a job out of high school and afford a home. Right, that's not true anymore. Right, wages have remained stagnant, and and in some ways they've gone down because things like uh, land prices have gone up, housing prices have gone up. Right, so. Real wages haven't gone up since like 1972, at least not significantly, um, in terms of the amount of hours you have to work for certain things. Now, there's some things that you can't really compare, like modern technology, things like the internet, things like I'm doing right here, you just simply could not do in the 80s. Um, so it's not it, it's not like there hasn't been any improvement at all, but um, it's. It's pretty close to to Mark to Marx's conception of hell is actually going on right now in the U.S. Uh, or as close as I think you could realistically get. Now Marx actually predicted that um, that it would go down, that that real wages would actually go down over time, and they ha and that has not been the case. They've just sort of remained they've remained stagnant overall. Although certain things have gone up in price, like tuition 
has has gone up in in real price and and housing has gone up in real price um okay so that's the first so, so that's the first thing the heaven and hell um now not necessary to this but it's definitely a plus is to have some kind of satan figure um hitler lucifer now marxism didn't really have a satan figure and libertarianism doesn't really have a satan figure so it's not universal to have a satan figure um you don't have to have it typically you have demonic individuals that don't rise to the level of a hitler or a satan analog um uh, those are more common but uh um like I guess you know, in a lot of so in a lot of Marxist circles, they can bring up examples of particularly nasty capitalists, or bring up like the Pinkertons or something, um, and those would be like demonic figures. But none of them rise to the level of a Satan or Hitler. Uh, okay, so the second thing is a sacred tribulation, um, and this works because people are attracted to the underdog narrative, and I'm not sure if they should really be split because the underdog is oppressed you know sort of the meek shall inherit the earth um so the underdog narrative and the sacred tribulation are kind of the same sort of thing um so if you're not a christian this is a lot more obvious um like like if you're not a christian then the trick is more obvious for when christians were dominant um the thing is, it doesn't do well to make an actual underdog the underdog in the oppression narrative, right? So in your oppression narrative, in your sacred tribulation, you don't pick actual underdogs. Um, because an actual underdog is likely despised by everybody, right? Like like back in, say, like in you know, the 1800s, uh, gypsies were not a very, were not a popular underdog for a sacred tribulation. Um, for reasons legitimate or illegitimate, if you center your oppression narrative around an actually despised group, you're not going to go very far. So the real trick of religion is to identify a group that is actually pretty powerful. You know, they don't have to be dominant, but they're actually pretty powerful. They're not completely despised, but they can be portrayed as downtrodden. Right? So... For a good part of like post-theistic religion, this was the working class, right? And the working class, of course, as as a group, like in total, like just the labor, they are extremely powerful because they constitute the entirety of the labor side of the capital labor ratio, right? The lab of all business and all government enterprise, you know, at least until uh, you know. I mean, maybe that'll change in a few years, but it's all dependent on human labor, right? And all capital was, of course, either land or it's something that some man possesses. And even, even you know, most of capital, aside from land, is created by laborers. And, of course, land, you know, land ownership is, in a sense, a function of, you know, gunmen. It's a function of police and the military that, that maintain property rights. So even that's a function of labor, right? So labor is actually a very powerful group, okay? And of course, they're not despised because they're the majority people, right? So they are per so they're great in the sense of, uh, of not being a despised group that you can use, that you can portray as an underdog, right? Um, and so th they're not despised because it's literally the majority of any of the population of any state is labor, right? So they're very easy to um, to not be despised because why would people despise themselves? And they're pretty powerful, right? So not despised, pretty powerful. Of course, the problem with labor has always been organization, right? Labor is a lot harder to organize than management, right? But the latent power of labor can always overwhelm the other estates if properly organized. And that's why you hear we need to organize labor, organize, 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 because that's the weakness of labor, even though it's inherently, you know, if mobilized to the same degree as management, it's always going to be management. The issue is organization. Um, so that is, and that's why labor was all, was a very good early, um, 
not early, not really early, but that's why labor for a long time was a very good um, uh, uh, character or central people for a sacred tribulation narrative. You know, obviously in the Bible, Jews have their sacred tribulation, Exodus, and the Babylonian captivity, oh, woe is me, and, and just, just shit out the mouth a lot. The lies about, about Egypt are just unbelievable. Like, we were slaves. They were mercenaries. It was like, oh, the Pharaoh didn't let us leave. <laughs> like, what I, I mean, what actually happened with the Jews leaving Egypt? You know, if you read Exodus, they, they say things like, oh, we traveled through basically the Northern Nile Delta, and the people in the Northern Nile Delta on our, on our travel uh, uh, to, to, to the land of Canaan, uh, they just gave us a bunch of stuff. They just gave us a bunch of provisions for our journey. <laughs> and then after they gave us the provisions for our journey, the Pharaoh then changed his mind and sent an army out to attack us. <laughs> it's so stupid. Like, like, of course, we know, you know, what's obviously happened is, is the Hebrews, who are not slaves in the normal sense, I mean, slave, whatever. They were mercenaries. They wanted to leave. The Pharaoh said, good riddance, probably. You know, they... And they went through the Nile Delta and started pillaging towns on their way to the Sinai up into the land of Canaan. As they were pillaging the Nile Delta, the Pharaoh went, hey, what the fuck? Sent an army to try to go get them, maybe maybe kill them, maybe do whatever, who knows. Um, and then the Hebrews managed to escape through the Sea of Reeds, blah, blah, blah. You know, you know all that stuff. And, and you know that the Hebrews, being a, being a, a, a band of mercenaries... Right, they were not. I mean, th there were women and children amongst their ranks, but they were. But all the men were, were military guys. So they were not quite the underdogs you might imagine. So when they went into Canaan, it wasn't like a whole bunch of like ragtag, petty civilians managed to conquer so, conquer Canaan by the grace of God. It was literally like, I mean, they, they were kind of like a horde army, <laughs> basically. They were kind of like a like an ethnic group that was like an. Like a like a na like an army nation on the march, like the Mongols or the you know or the Kazakhs or something. Um, but yeah, anyway. Um, so how do you so given that labor is so powerful, you know, how do you portray labor as being oppressed? How do you portray them as being oppressed? And, and it's really easy, you know. You just compare the living standards of labor and management on a per person basis right just you do it per capita and you find oh look management has a much higher per capita you know amount of wealth even though labor has more total um, although that may be less true today <laughs> um so thus the more powerful group is portrayed as david and management is portrayed as goliath right um so now, I'm not denying the existence of iniquitous arrangements, like things like serfdom or collusion among capital to keep down wages across industries. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. Or, I'm simply referring to the kinds of groups that are good candidates for a sacred tribulation. And that is a group that is reasonably powerful but can't be portrayed as weak, right? Blacks, <laughs> right? And to a lesser extent, Hispanics are very useful in this sense, as they can be portrayed as weak and put upon by referencing their lower standards of living on like a per capita basis, you know. And and so what then can happen is that measures taken by whites to sort of be free from, particularly blacks, to be free from blacks, right? These are then reinterpreted and reimagined as forms of oppression, like no blacks allowed gets converted from a defensive action to an aggressive action in people's minds, right? So, and, and so blacks go from being like, a, like a, a fairly powerful group that was something like, you know, you know, a third of the population of the South, right? That, that was constant, that was, that, was that, that, that had to be aggressively like managed and kept away, right? to being like a, an oppressed and put upon and, and woe is me sort of group, right? And measures of whites to protect themselves from, from the Africans then get reinterpreted and reimagined as aggression. So 
Um, that's how the sacred tribulation of the blacks was was formed, and, and it follows the same pattern as as that, that of the Jews. Um, what's interesting about the Jews is sort is sort of how how like you know how you have a sacred tribulation that centers around the Jews, but then the Jews were eventually despised, and yet people continue to believe in Christianity. And that was kind of hard. That was kind of a difficult thing because as more people in Europe came into contact with Jews, like as Jews went through North Africa up into Spain and different, I don't, I'm sure you guys have seen the video. Basically, the migration of the Jews through Europe, which is basically they get they get expelled from everywhere in Europe until they end up in an area known as the Pale of Settlement, which is basically, which is basically like the Pripet Marshes, right? Where land nobody wants, and it's like, okay, Jews, you go there. Right, like nobody wants Jews in their kingdom, and they basically kick, get kicked out of everywhere. Um, and of course, we know 1917, uh, Tsar Alexander the Third, I believe, opens the Pale of Settlement. Right, and then like like a year later, the Bolshevik Revolution. So it's yeah, it's like oh, I guess I guess that's why they had the Pale of Settlement. Um, but uh, but it's interesting with Christianity, they sort of ha always had this problem in that Jews are, you know, they like they weren't like at the outset of Christianity, most people in the Roman Empire didn't really know what about the Hebrews or the Jews. They didn't really know about them. And so having a sacred tribulation centered around the Jews, you know, it could sort of take root. But then as Jews move, these actual Jews who are supposedly like the, the people of this sacred tribulation, you know, as Europeans come into contact with these Jews, they, you know, now there's kind of a problem, right? Because you have this text where, where Jews are sort of the central people of a sacred tribulation. And so Christianity has to now ha has to like sort of, well, it's not really about the Jews. That's the Old Testament, you know. And of course, Jesus said like that's something about the Old Testament no longer being, you know, what you have to follow anymore. And so. You know, I'm not particularly interested in like theological truth as much as I am of the fact that if most Europeans came knew about Jews on day one when Christianity was first being spread into Italy and the and the Church of Rome was being founded, um, if they actually knew about Jews, Christianity probably never would have taken root. It, it's the fact that Jews really started to arrive in Europe and mass later um, that I think allowed christianity to ever take hold because if because if europeans were you know either pagans or, or believe believed in some sort of uh, secular philosophy at the time if they actually knew what jews were like having having a religion that was formed from a jew jesus and and for whom jews were like the, the, the central people and part of the revelations was that the tribes of israel would would go would, would return or something that that was like like the 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 most important thing. Um, I don't I don't think it would have sold. I, basically, I don't think Christianity would have sold if Romans knew if, if Romans had extensive contact with Jews. Um, but by the time the Europeans started having extensive contact with Jews, Christianity was already pretty well established. So, um, but yeah. Um, so what am I going on about? So like, um, like if we take a look at like in the 1960s and 70s, like homosexuals in the 60s and 70s, homosexuals were not a useful group for a kind of sacred tribulation um, because homosexuals were despised. Right. And that's sort of just the default of humanity in general is to despise homosexuals. Right. Because man, butt sex is gross. And that's basically it. That's that's basically why people despise homosexuals because it's gross, and and you can say, well, that's not a philosophically good reason to despise it. You know, it's a, like, okay, thank you. This is why I don't care about philosophy. Um, but the thing is, it took a great deal of conditioning to get white people and to, and to some extent East Asians in the U.S. to stop despising homosexuals. Right? It, it took a lot of work. To get them to stop doing that and 
ironically, this was done largely by re... <laughs> I think this was done largely by reframing anti-homosexual attitudes as a product of the previous religion, Christianity, right? Because, you know, by the time you get to the 80s and 90s, Christianity is on, on a serious downward trend. And the number of people who no longer identify as Christians, I think, understates how, how much Christianity has, has declined. Because Christianity has not only declined in the number of people who formerly ascribe to it, but it has also massively declined in the fervor, right? There's plenty of people who are Christ who who are nominal Christians whose main religion is, you know, shit liberty and, and the sacred tribulation of the Negro, right? That that takes precedent over over Christ. Um so what I think has happened is that ironically, um the acceptance of homosexuals has been achieved by reframing anti-homosexual attitudes as being a product of Christianity, even though that's not true at all, right? Christianity wasn't unique in at all in, in its condemnation of homosexuality. That wasn't unique at all. That was just something that was in the Bible is like, yeah, obviously, you know. Um, so... So we have so these unnatural pro homosexual beliefs, you know, obviously the natural disgust remains, and this is seen in studies. Even people who say that they're totally tolerant of homosexuals, they still get grossed out by men kissing, right? It's, so you can only you can only condition you can't condition you can only condition so far. You can only condition people so far. Um, so this unnatural these unnatural pro homosexual beliefs they rode the wave of anti Christian sentiment. Right. So I, I think that's what happened. And I think that's <laughs> kind, kind, kind of interesting. Um, the lie that Christianity was uniquely uh, anti-homosexual or anti-homosexual attitudes came from Christianity. Right. What, what actually happened is that people have always been anti-homosexual. And when they're Christian, they'll quote the Bible as to why homosexuality is bad. But, it, but if people in, say, the year 1000 A.D., weren't Christians, they'd find some other reasons to say homosexuality is bad. Because because everyone does does so. Um, so, today, an example of trying to make a despised group part of a sacred tribulation would be transsexuals. Um, and, um, and obviously this isn't happening yet, but obviously it's coming. Everyone knows it's coming as uh, pedophiles. I remember back in 2011, I was talking to this guy, Secular Numinous, um, and I was telling him, look, you know, like we had the gay thing, right? With, the, you know, the, the son, you know, the gays being accepted and gay marriage being a thing. Well, you know what's coming next, Newman? You, you know, you know who's the next sacred, sacred, you know, rallying pole for, for another sacred tribulation? It's going to be trannies. I told him it's going to be trannies, and he was like, oh, no, that's gross. And this Numinous guy, he was sort of, he was kind of, a, kind kind of, well, he was what, he was what would be called a quote-unquote leftist back in 2010. I think today he'd probably be called a fascist because he's anti-trans, or he was anti-trans then. Um, but, um, you know, um, but yeah, but yeah, that's, that's sort of interesting. So, so yeah, so obviously, so obviously, transsexuals is sort of the the despised group that is being pushed forward, part of the sacred tribulation, and they're doing and they're doing the thing where you know anti transsexual bigotry. They're saying that's a product of like the previous religion or something. That's a product of Christianity. Um, and coming up next is going to be pedophiles. Um, I think it's pretty clear that you you went homosexuals, then transsexuals, and and it's it's going to be pedophiles next. Uh, so yeah, so the mania, the kind of mania, of like the modern open order religion of the United States and NATO and NATO countries in general. This is like the NATO land religion. Um, to where it started to force sacred tribulations and narr narratives for like actually despised groups is very strange. Like, because the thing is, Africans weren't 
ever like truly despised like whites didn't want to be like certainly whites didn't want to be around them right that's why they created sundown towns and segregated schools and all that stuff so clearly they didn't like black people but they didn't hate them either they weren't a despised group they were just kind of like uh, keep them away please thanks uh back of the bus please um but like they, but the thing is like blacks were never despised in the way jews have been despised um yeah but uh so and the thing is they they didn't do this in the 60s or 70s right they didn't they didn't push sacred tribulation narratives for actually despised groups they they pushed the sacred tribulation narrative for the africans you know um and so like africans like africans in the us at the time actually constituted about 15% of the us population a, a higher percentage than today believe it or not um and they were certainly close to as powerful as any particular white voting block. If you were to break down whites by ethnicity, or if you were to break down whites by sort of, you know, electoral profile, like blacks being sort of a monolith, um, the black voting block, like the African voting block, was certainly as powerful as any white voting block, if not more powerful than any single one, right? And so, as part of a coalition of say northeastern whites. You know, Northeastern whites for whom their knowledge of Africans is sort of theoretical and rose tinted, as opposed to being based on experience, as it was for whites in the South, who developed very negative views of Africans. Kind of like whites in South Africa, you know, they have, you know, being in contact with the Africans, they, they, they what do they do? They set up segregation. Right. Whereas all the whites in, in England and in France, and it's like, oh, why are you so, why are you so old? mean to the blacks of course because they don't you know they don't actually live there they don't actually have to deal with reality they're thinking about these people in more of a theoretical sense right um but uh but the thing is like like obviously africans being 50 percent of the population that's not going to be enough on their own to like sway policy but they're but they're powerful in part of a larger coalition right like northeastern white shit libs you know wouldn't be able to get what they wanted without blacks basically without blacks flipping states like michigan and minnesota um so and of course they won right this the state that sacred tribulation narrative won out um you know this coalition ended up being more powerful than those whites who wanted freedom from blacks, freedom from Africans. And as a result, uh, the US doesn't have hardly any good cities anymore, right? You know, the Detroit, uh, big chunks of Chicago, Atlanta, they've all been Africanized. Uh, and so the, and it's, it's funny, you have these Europeans who mock Americans for having like really terrible cities <laughs> Like, but they don't draw the connection as to why that might possibly be. So the more powerful coalition won, as expected. But the trick of of their gaining the power was portraying the Africans as the downtrodden, as portraying them as like a powerless victim group. Um, now, sometimes the absurdity of this is brought up from time to time, like the notion of redneck whites being some great oppressor because they wouldn't let Africans into their diners or something. It doesn't really track. Like, you know, I mean, the core narrative of African men barging into someone's diner and demanding to be served because, like, justice or something, you know. I mean, that's still presented to impressionable children as, like, as a sacred tribulation. Like, the sacred tribulation is that this diner won't serve you because they don't like black people. Like, that that's the horror. <laughs> that's the tribulation. Like some diner doesn't want you in there. Like, you know, as a, you know, as opposed to the, you know, and that's, that's seen as like tribulation against the Africans, as opposed to the Africans just sort of being jerks who won't leave white people alone and won't let white people have their own spaces, have their own little, you know, like white diner. Um, now I'll say that to a lot of people and, you know, they're, well, there's a chance that um, that they'll have a reaction, a negative reaction to how d dismissive I am towards segregation 
from Africans. Um, and like if like if you're a shit lib and that's your reaction, that's not you. Like Richard Spencer had a saying called "Become who you are." Now I think Richard Spencer, on the whole, was kind of adult. But every but Richard Spencer is weird. Like every once in a while, he would say something that's like actually really insightful. And by really insightful, it's like kind of a weird thing that I know that I like I actually know is true. And it's always weird. Like Richard Spencer says like a whole bunch of dumb things, but then he says something that like like oh. Like that's actually true, and I'm surprised that you would know that. But yeah, basically, like, like if you have a reaction that like you're really, that you get really peeved at the idea at, at someone being dismissive and curt towards segregation toward the Africans, that's not really your reaction. That's that's conditioning. Um, the kind of reaction and an appropriate reaction that you would have to segregation from Africans would be the same as your reaction to Japanese establishments that say no foreigners, right? Like people don't have that much of a reaction towards Japanese who say, keep out, like no gaijin, keep out the foreigners. Or your reaction to a gated community, right? People tend not to have a particularly reaction at all towards gated communities, nor do they have much of a reaction towards a religiously exclusive community, right? Like, pe like people don't naturally have it have problems with segregation, right? Evidence of the, the fact that people didn't have problems with segregation in the South for a hundred years, right? It wasn't until they were told to have a problem with it that they that they then had a problem, with it, right? So it, it's clearly fabricated. So. You know, now there's a chance, like, a sh now here's what a shit will do in reality, is what they might say is that, oh, well, I feel just as negatively towards segregation towards the blacks as I do about other kinds of segregation, like, or, or, or the, or they, they may try to say that segregation towards the blacks has more of, like, a negative historical context or whatever, you know. But what they're, what they're doing is, for that is they're pretzeling in order to maintain consistency, right? The reality is that the shit lib doesn't actually care about segregation per se, right? They don't particularly care, like a shit lib wouldn't particularly care about segregation from Africans if he wasn't told that it was just the worst thing ever and was actually, and, and actually wanting to segregate from Africans in particular, that's actually uh, a symptom of a deeper pathology um, that is somehow related to Central European political movements in the 1930s. Um, but that's re but that's religion. That's religion for you. It makes it makes you insane, or or more accurately, everybody is a little bit insane, and it's just a mat and it's just a matter of managing that insanity. So theistic religions they quarantined insanity. Right, this cause seeking and story believing, they quarantine that into La La Land, into Holy Land, God, Heaven, Hell. Don't worry about Earth. Earthly existing is earthly existence is passing. Just shut up. You know, render under Caesar what is Caesar's, and you will be rewarded in heaven. My kingdom is in heaven. Right. Now. The, the, there's an obvious downside to this and that it's easier to abuse people if they think that earth is just one small piece of their their story of existence since literally all earthly existence is passing if you believe in the eternal afterlife but the upside is that that this stuff probably reduced the number of wars but i don't want to get into that um but the thing is today, since gods aren't believable anymore and less and less believable, and even to the extent they are, people are, you know, maybe they're Sunday Christians, say they believe in God, maybe they do. Um, it, 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 it doesn't work as a containment anymore. Even among the people who still say that they're Christians and maybe even sort of think they are, it doesn't contain it the way it used to and so all of this insanity that people have that used to be like you know 
focus on sins and stuff in the afterlife, that insanity gets transmitted onto Earth. Um, so coincidentally, the period of the relative rise of the United States and Europe versus the rest of the world coincided with when religious feeling was effectively quarantined by Christianity, right? And what I think this did was this allowed people to be mundane and sensible day to day. Okay, and the relative decline of Europe and the United States has coincided with religious feeling breaking this theistic containment. Okay, now when it breaks containment, that doesn't mean it goes away. It, it, it doesn't just disappear, right? It goes into something else. And so you get the rise of things like Marxism, and then you get the more open order religions, which is now col colloquially and irritatingly, in my opinion, called leftism. So, yeah. So anyways, that's, uh, I'm streaming, guys. I'm streaming. Uh, let me see, see if I have any more, any more white power chats here. Uh, where are we? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Anonymous. Okay, so, um, $5 from Anonymous. The Austrian school is considered a joke nowadays. For example... Mises rejected differential equations in economic planning despite evidence of its success. He never elaborated why he rejected it. Um, no, he didn't he didn't elaborate why he rejected that in particular because part of the Austrians is that they're basically like anti-math in general. Um, because they basically basically Austrians have a like a foundational skepticism of econometrics. <laughs> so um and, and they argue as to why praxeology is better than, than empirical economics. because And they basically say empirical economics is crap and will lead you down to blind alleys. And empirical economics, like econometrics, will work for a little while. But eventually, you know, you're... you're... Basically, the Austrian argument is econometrics are not the thing in itself, whereas more abstract theorems they call praxeology you know deriving an economic theory from th from the base assumption that man acts to quell felt uneasiness that that is actually going to be a better model of the thing in itself than any amount of empirical economics that's sort of the austrian idea so mises is not going to so Mises is not going to give a particular opinion as to why he, he rejects differential equations in economic planning simply because he's going to reject differential equations in economic planning because he, he rejects all economic math, basically. So, okay, $3 from Hater Time. Spent a few weeks poppy, watching popular Destiny clip, clips and he believes in magic science, man. Oh, absolutely. He believes in the truth towers. As the Wizards and the Truth Towers. He said it shouldn't be only him debunking you and Sean last, as though someone from the Ivory Tower should take a break from what they're doing to defeat you. Can't take a break from what they're doing. These people. Take a break from what they're doing. Uh, yeah, well, well, another thing, like, here's... Like, Destiny... I don't know. I don't know if Destiny learned the truth that the gap between him and Magic Science Man was like on any given, like basically Destiny could spend like three hours reading on any particular topic and know about as much as any Magic Science Man in that general field would. Like, for example, if you spend three years three years if you spend three hours just reading like something from arthur jensen you'll probably know more about um iq than the typical uh phd in psychology um if destiny knew this would destiny be um flattered at this fact that that he can that he is so close to the to the to magic science man that he's actually a lot closer to magic science man than he ever imagined um that that basically what it comes down to is that he really he get he can function 
with sort of the equivalent accuracy of Magic Science Man by just taking more time to write anything, whereas Magic Science Man can, can sort of just do it quicker, sort of on the fly, because he has because Magic Science Man has has more of like the the training. Um, if he knew that, would he be flattered or would he be horrified? I think it'd be a mixture of both. Because obviously he'd be flattered that he's actually a lot closer to Magic Science Man than he ever thought, but he'd also be horrified that he doesn't have this sort of, you know, psychological backstop, right? That 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 he that basically by having Magic Science Man, what that does is it frees people who believe in Magic Science Man from the problem of induction, right? Um, and it's the same sort of psychological uh, thing that that the priests did, right? You don't have to worry about what is true because the priests know what is true because they have uh, mysterious knowledge, right? They have hidden knowledge. And uh, the academic journals sort of work in the same way because they're written in an incomprehensible manner. Sometimes they're they're literally paywall. There is Sci-Hub, but few people know about Sci-Hub. Um, but, and so in a sense, like what goes on in the Truth Towers today is kind of mysterious to a lot of people. Um, and so it functions uh, in, in the same psychological way. And and it's also similar in that, like, there's, you know, how, how do people justify the truth towers? They justify it by referencing things that are not, th that aren't the things in question. Like, they'll say, oh, sociology is true because computers work. They won't say that, um, but they'll, but that's sort of the vague connection that their brain is drawing that because computer science work is a real thing and computers work, that must mean sociology, you know, is sort of on the same level, or at least it's close. And and that's and that's the same trick that goes back to the Middle Ages, where you put medicine and natural philosophy in the same cathedral school as you have theology. Right? It's it's the same trick and and. You know, this same thing was done in the Soviet Union. You had Marxist theory being taught right alongside biology. You know, and it's it's the same stupid trick. And and fortunately, there's a certain class of people at every point in time in history that fall for this trick, and they're and they're a menace. Anyway, um, thank you, Telegram. Uh, have you ever considered using Google Earth as a way of pointing out landmarks during streams? Is real clear up? Powerful streaming tool I am on. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, when I use Google Earth a lot and I and I'm zooming in and out all the time, um, my my ISP throttles my bandwidth <laughs> and my and my internet connection drops for a few minutes. Um, so I actually have to be pretty careful, um, how much how fast I scroll through Google Maps and how much I zoom in and out because it kills my my, my bandwidth. So I. I wouldn't use it. Sorry, Deltron. Thank you for the three dollars. All right, where are we? Uh, how long have I been going? Well, I've been going on for a while. I've been going on for two hours or one hour. Did it start at one hour? Did the stream start at one hour? I don't know why that happened, but I think it may have. Restart the stream, Ryan, so we can all hear the replay. Um, no, because then people are gonna click off and they won't come back. <laughs> trust me, trust me. I, I I know I have experience from videos where you split up the video. People don't watch the second video. You're better off making one long video because, like, if the video ends, then it's like a, a break in the action. And they go, oh, I'm interested in something else now, and so they'll go click on something else. So no, sorry, I can't end the stream. Um. Okay, so something I've thought of is that at the moment, there seems to be a great opportunity to seize several key issues that have sort of been left on the floor. Um, okay, so I'm now I'm just going to say it and I don't have faith in the America First moniker because, 
Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why. So first off, like, the America, like, okay, let's, let's talk about America. So for America, there, there are no racial or lineage standards, right? Um, heavens no, like, like a racial standard for American or a, or a lineage standard that you have to be descended from these families to be an American. Like, obviously that doesn't exist. In fact, that's like the most evil thing that could be. That's like the worst thing. That's like the greatest sin is, is a, is a, uh, racial or lineage standard. So there, so, okay. So f to, to be an American, there is no racial or lineage standard. Is there a religious standard, theistic, non-theistic, what we call ideology? Is there any kind of standard of creed to be an American? And the answer to that is no, there is no standard of creed to be an American. You can believe the constitution, not be a constitution. You can be a Marxist. You can you can be you can be a, a founding fathersist. You can be whatever. Okay, so there are no religious standards. Um, there are definitely no wealth or competency standards to become an American. You know, I think at one time when states were more were more in charge of, of naturalization, that they did have uh, wealth or competency standards, but that's not true anymore. I mean, they're bringing in boatloads of just Somalis and just, and the government's putting a sticker on them saying American. So, so there's no cop, so there's no competency standards. There's no wealth standards. There's no religious standards. There's no racial or lineage standards. And okay. And, and, and I know the people watching this here, but for the average person who may see this stream, you may think those are good things. You may think it's a horrible thing to have a racial or lineage standard. Fine. You may think it's a horrible thing to have a religious test for citizenship. Fine. Religious or ide religion, I also mean like non-theistic, non-theistic. I mean, I mean like a theistic religion or an ideology. I say religion. You may think that it's good to not have that standard. Fine. You may think it's good to not have a wealth standard. Fine. You may think it's good to not have a competency standard. Fine. But then you have no standards. An American means nothing. Right? So, so what's the point of American? You know, even if, so if you're saying that there shouldn't be any of those kinds of standards, okay, but then stop caring about American or America because it's not a thing, right? Unless, unless you're saying, well, I just, I love the government, which nobody does. So shut up. So, so what is there? There's nothing, I guess, I guess dirt. You, you, I really love this particular soil on the planet. I mean, it's it's fairly well endowed with natural resources, but other than that, there's no people people don't aren't, aren't emotionally attached to that. So, um, like a group as petty as Mensa. Now, I think Mensa is retarded. I think the high IQ society. I think that's stupid. Um, but even but that as stupid as Mensa is, that's more meaningful than America or American. Anyway. So the thing is, if you are, and and that and I think that is a very important criticism that we have to make is that American doesn't mean anything anymore, because um, we're entering a world where whites are gonna be a minority. It's gonna happen, and we're gonna have to start being more, like, <laughs> we're gonna start to have to be more um, partisan. And not partisan in the sense of Republican Democrat, but partisan in the sense of like partisan, you know, warfare, political warfare. Um, so when you identify with American, you're first of all not only denying yourself that fundamental criticism, right? You're de you're basically de you're basically taking a potential argument out of your quiver, which that American doesn't mean anything. But you're also depriving yourself of a fundamental criticism of the American citizen uh, system. That is a criticism of democracy itself, right? Um, okay, so right now uh, I made a video that I think is very important. Um, I'm just actually, and I also need to give my voice a little break. So I'm just going to go ahead and play a video for you guys. And there may be some people here who haven't seen this, this video. It was, it was made a long time ago. So let's, uh, here we go. 
to go guys. So there was a paper from 2014 that faced some criticism testing theories of American politics, oh. elites, interest groups, and average citizens. And they looked at 1,779 policy changes from 1981 to 2002. In 2015, Martin Gillens did a follow-up where he looked at 2,245 policy changes from 1964 to 2006. And what these guys found was that policy changes were driven entirely by elite opinion and to a lesser extent by special interest opinion. According to them, average citizen's preference had almost no effect on policy change. Whether the average citizen's 90% opposed a policy or 90% supported a policy, it still had about a 30% chance of happening. With economic elites, the story is radically different. If they all oppose something, it doesn't pass. If they all support it, it'll have a roughly 60% chance of getting passed. For interest groups, the important effects are around the middle, when interest groups began to net support a change. There were, of course, rebuttals to this. The main criticism was that median income Americans won 47% of the time. And as far as I'm aware, this is true, and Martin Gillens did not challenge this figure. But how can this be the case, and at the same time, this graph showing no apparent impact of average citizen opinion how can this also be true? Well, the reason for this is thresholds. If 51% of average Americans support X and 49% of elites also support X and X gets passed, then that's coded as the average citizens overpowering the elites because the elites net oppose that. On the other hand, if 25% of average Americans support Y, but 75% of elites support Y and then Y gets passed, that's then coded as the elites overpowering the average Americans, so that's one win for them. So, given these two events, it's one and one, right? The average Americans and the elites are each winning about half the time, right? Of course, doing a straight win-loss criteria is grossly misleading as it hides the margins on each issue and doesn't fully capture the power rating of each group. What Gillens did was take a threshold, comparing instances in which 75% of elites or 75% of middle income people either supported or opposed a law. The first comparison was looking at policies they supported. When the affluent strongly favor a change, but the middle income doesn't strongly favor the change, it gets passed 55% of the time. If both the affluent and the middle income strongly favor something, it gets adopted 49% of the time, which would indicate a negative effect of middle income support. The same thing is seen when the affluent don't strongly support something. If the middle income also don't strongly support it, it gets passed 29% of the time. But if the middle income do strongly support a measure and the affluent strongly oppose it, it only gets passed 24% of the time. Again, indicating a negative impact of middle class support on an issue. Looking the other way, you see the impact of affluent support on something being between 26 points and 25 points. So the policies that get passed, or at least got passed between 1980 and 2002, were those that the rich supported and the middle class did not support. The same story can be seen in terms of killing policies that each group opposes. If the affluent strongly oppose a policy, but the middle class doesn't strongly oppose it, it's only adopted 4% of the time. If the affluent strongly oppose and the middle class also strongly opposes a policy, it gets adopted 15% of the time. If the affluent don't strongly oppose something and neither does the middle class, it gets adopted 34% of the time. If the affluent don't strongly oppose something, but the middle class does strongly oppose it, it gets adopted 40% of the time. Again, indicating a negative impact of middle class preference on policy that gets adopted. A follow-up was done in 2015, which expanded the number of policy changes analyzed to 2,245 and the year range to the years 1964 to 2006, and there was no significant difference in the results. Now, this finding made a bit of a splash at the time, back in 2014, but then just kind of went away. People forgot about it and went back to electoral politics, including me. I heard about this paper at the time. I thought it was interesting but then I just sort of forgot about it. 
Trump supporters who have been paying attention are actually disappointed that Trump isn't getting his agenda passed, even though Trump's actual policies are pretty popular. So Trump should be getting most of his agenda passed, right? But it's not what the elites want. The elites want a financialized economy, a compliant labor force. But after reading Gillen's 2014, Gillen's 2015, I recalled this other paper I read on how regimes classified as autocracies respond to shifts in public opinion. From elections, information, and policy responsiveness in autocratic regimes, Mike Miller looked at what he classified as electoral authoritarian regimes. These are regimes which have elections and representatives, but the executive operates independent of any other branch. They're functionally a dictatorship, but they have a Congress as kind of an appendix. This unique situation allows for us to see an executive that doesn't have to legally respond to a Congress, but still gets the information of an election, which is salience-weighted public opinion. In Miller's analysis of 269 elections in 86 countries from 1975 to 2004, he found that a 20% loss in legislative seats for the autocrats' party corresponded to a 0.26% increase in education spending and a 0.29% increase in social welfare spending. A 20% increase in the seats of the ruling party corresponded to an increase in military spending of 1.65%. Now, with these countries classed as electoral authoritarian regimes, they're starting with much lower levels of education and welfare spending than the U.S. is at now. So I don't think it would be appropriate to use these metrics as an indicator of policy responsiveness in the U.S. Moreover, the U.S. doesn't have as wild electoral swings as most other countries do, which I think is due to the U.S. really being something like seven or eight countries average together, with each one of them thinking they're the real America. But with Gillens, it appears as if there is no effect of popular opinion on policy outcomes in the U.S., whereas with Miller, it appears in these electoral authoritarian regimes, the regime is actually more responsive to public opinion than the U.S. federal government. And suddenly, I'm reminded of one of Hans Hermann Hoppe's arguments for monarchy. As a politician, you're an actor within a government. You are not intimately tied to the general health of the country. In fact, if you're a senator, you can gesticulate and claim that you had nothing to do with anything bad that happened or anything perceived to be bad happened in the, in the country. Even as president in the U.S., you can say your ability to act was constrained by the Congress or the courts, that you inherited a mess from the other guy, that you only had four or eight years to implement your plan. And maybe it's really true. Maybe there really is no single actor or group of actors that you can blame in the U.S. The buck doesn't stop anywhere. But if you're, say, Pinochet, and you have total ultimate control over everything going on in Chile, well, if something goes badly, there's no one else to hide behind. You can't blame the Republicans or whatever because you're the only ones in power. In the U.S., you can pick a side. And then if anything goes wrong, it's either because of the other side or if your policy was implemented and that went wrong, well, it's because of those, you know, those lousy Democrats corrupted the policy or the Republicans crippled Obamacare. It wasn't really what we wanted. You know, there's all sorts of games you can play. The system is sufficiently complicated that you can always find some plausible out. So the buck never stops anywhere. So non-sham electoral politics, or what we think of as non-sham electoral politics in the U.S., it diverts your energy away from the things that could actually challenge the regime and redirects you down the blind alley of electoral politics. Here, run around in this little idiot box a bunch, hit the pads, tire yourself out. Okay, you elected Donald Biden or whatever. Yay, you won. Oh, better luck next time. Now back in your cage. In other electoral authoritarian regimes, the public knows that the elections are a sham. But what if you had an electoral authoritarian regime where the public was well and truly conned and truly believed that elections mattered? Well, you'd have a level of control beyond any dictatorship because at least open dictatorships now have the burden and the odium of being a dictatorship and have the policy buck stopping at them. And while direct action is the only way to throw out a dictator, at least the public knows this fact. And the fact that in these banana republics, the population knows the elections are shams is possibly why those regimes are more responsive 
to changes in public opinion than in the U.S. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. 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 Two. 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 That is that. Uh, all right. Uh, what are we doing? Okay. So basically, the only way to affect policy in a uh, in a Republican system, Democratic system, because right? what happens is basically. In republics, you vote for representatives, they go to the Congress, and then they just, they more or less do whatever they want. Um, because the worst the worst outcome they could have from doing um, horrible things that they want to do that the general public doesn't want to be done, you know, basically a whole bunch of policies that, that resulted in it being impossible for people to get a house and start a family on a minimum wage income. Right, which was possible in the 80s, but isn't possible now. Right, basically a series of horrible bad policies that benefited the super rich, caused the the. I'm sure you guys have seen that chart where basically productivity continues to go up, but wages stay flat. You know, um, like the, the, the very broad strokes is that that that's all a function of politicians doing stuff that the public doesn't want, um, but getting away with it. And the way they're able to get away with it is that they hide behind elections. Elections serve as kind of a release valve. Um, whereas in dictatorships, in dictatorships, you don't have that release valve, right? So in Russia, where, which is, Russia is, is we would call it an electoral authoritarian regime. They have, they technically have a Congress, but like not really. And, but the result of that is, is that the dictator, Putin, is way more popular than any U.S. president because a dictator has to be more popular because a dictator is far more reliant on uh, public support. And the reason for that is because a dictator is far more reliant on military support. And what is the military made up of? It's made up of average Jew, average Joes, average dudes. I was, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't trying to say average Jews. I was actually sort of merging in my head average joes and average dudes so Jew, you know okay um so and because the military is made up of like average joes or average ivans they're you know the military is like part of the public right and so public opinion is very closely related to military opinion so the dictator is very much interested in public opinion. He has an incentive to care about public opinion because, the, because, and, and so as a result, a dictator is actually much more popular uh, typically than democratically elected presidents. So he's much more popular, but on the other hand, there tends to be much more political violence in dictatorship. The reason for that is because there's no elections, right? There's no release valve. The only way to get any political change in a dictatorship is through political violence. It usually doesn't work, but it's the only possibility, right? Um, now that's also, but what, what I'm saying is that's also true in quote unquote democratic states. Um, it's just that people have the illusion that elections can influence policy or that public opinion can influence policy when it cannot. Ultimately, ultimately the only way to change policy is through violence. You know, and you could think whatever you want about that. But um, uh, violence or institutional takeover or bribes. Basically, like if you can manage to take over the, the truth towers, the truth towers then can tell the politicians what to think. And then they'll implement what you tell them is is the truth. Because you because you control the truth towers, you control all the, the funny hats. And by funny hats, I mean the, the hat, the funny hats people wear at graduation. You control you know, what you have to do to get those degrees and then and you control what is the degree truth stuff. 
which then determines what the senators believe, because that then determines what is, you know, intellectual opinion. So, um, but yeah, that's basically it. Bribes, institutional takeover, and violence. That's it. That's how, that's how you change policy. Okay. Voting, voting doesn't do, do shit. Uh, and when you realize that, <laughs> it's funny, what basically happened is that I think white people in the U.S., and in many other countries, they had this belief that for the most part, the American system would function as advertised. That like, yeah, there would, okay, there's, there's bad apples, you know, and occasionally there'd be corrupt officials and senators who don't vote, who don't vote the way their constituents want here and there. But in the main, it's gonna work. And, and every once in a while, we have to clear out the bad apples. But the thing is, there's no evidence it ever worked. It, there's no evidence that it ever worked. And you want to say, well, this analysis here, it only goes it only it only goes back to 1964, right? Well, maybe it worked before 1964. Well, here's something people don't realize is that the New Deal wasn't popular. Right? You know, if you if you go to public school, you you know, one thing that is just sort of lost on people is that the New Deal was a wildly unpopular uh, program, and Roosevelt was expected to lose the 1940 election, you know, and he only won because, well, he only won because the war had broken out, and there was this myth that, oh, you don't want to change horses midstream, so Roosevelt ended up winning. But the point, but the more important point of that is that in 19, that the New Deal was unpopular. Um, so... <laughs> So basically, the government was doing a whole bunch of stuff that whatever your opinion on the maybe you think that the new that, that things that were the New Deal programs like whatever if if you think the New Deal was a good thing whatever I'm not talking about whether it actually was a good thing or a bad thing I'm just saying it wasn't popular and yet it was passed so this so clearly to some extent this stuff was being done you know in at least in the the 1930s. So this goes back at least as far back to the 1930s. I think it goes back to the founding. I think it goes back to the to the to the um, the the tax the tax on on spirits and carriages, which led to the whiskey rebellion. Right. Basically, I think this dynamic goes back to the founding. We don't have good evidence. We we don't have like a nice little study like this guy did for um, going back to the founding. But I see no reason to believe it wouldn't. I don't know what's what's so different. I don't know if the situation is so radically different at the founding that they would less likely be able to get away with unpopular things. We know they got away with the taxes on on uh, spirits and carriages, like like right after the revolution. So it's, I mean, that's just one one example. But it seems like this has always been the case. That that it's not broken. It never it never worked in the first place. It's not it's not like it worked. And then stop working. I mean, that I mean that's technically possible because we don't know much before 1964. But there's no reason to believe that. Basically, there's no compelling evidence that it ever worked as advertised, right? Um, and so what happens? But the thing is, most white people for all this time have believed that it worked, or at least mostly worked. That the American system functioned as advertised. That it was in fact democratic they ended up being wrong and whites in the u.s have lost to people who kind of never had faith in the american system ever now the reason for example blacks didn't have faith in the u.s system were for bullshit reasons right they'll, they'll be like why are we segregated this is the system not working no that's that's one of the archaic things that was good about that that, that is working like keeping you away from whites is is a good thing it's it, it promotes freedom um, but to them, that was it not working, and so they ended up not having faith in the system. And that lack of faith in the system served them well. Same with Jews. You know, lack of faith in the system served them well. Faith in the system have, has served whites very poorly. Very poorly. Um, so, and another thing that I think whites never figured out is that human existence is constant... I wouldn't say, it's not constant war. I think that that goes too far. Um, 
but the line between politics and war is subjective. It's certainly constant violence or threat of violence, right? So like taxation, think taxation. Whether or not you personally perceive taxation as an act of war, it's a function of how legitimate you view it. But ultimately, if you don't pay your taxes and you resist paying taxes persistently, you will get capped. And by resist persistently, I mean when the cops come to arrest you for not paying your taxes, you say, I'm not going to pay. I'm not being arrested because part of if you submit to being arrested, you're, you're basically submitting to the idea of taxation. So if you resist persistently, you will get capped. Like ultimately, and, th and that's th and that's the reality of all laws by a state. The reality is that all laws are ultimately enforced by you getting capped in the end, right? Um, this is Molyneux calls it the gun in the room, and it's just it's just a reality of the state that you know. And the thing is, they'll do enforcement of those. They'll start by sending letters, and then they'll you know they may try to work through the banks to get you, and if that doesn't work, they'll send guys to your house to try to maybe talk to you, then they'll send guys to arrest you. And then if you resist arrest, they'll kill you, right? Ultimately, at, at, it's sort of an inverted pyramid of enforcement by the state, but ultimately they will kill you, right? So ultimately all, like, all of society is predicated on the threat of being killed. And this would be true in a stateless society as well. This is something that I kind of disagreed with, with like the ANCAPs. Um, cause they talked about things like, yeah, you have, you have to pay for, to subscribe to a legal service or else you'd be an outlaw in which in case anyone can kill you, you know? Um, and, and you have to subscribe to a military service or else, you know, you could be kicked out of an area for, for being a free rider for, for defense or something. And that is, um, you know, and that, that was, that, I guess that's sort of a fundamental disagreement with the ANCAPs is that, I, is that, that there is no escape there is no escaping the gun in the room right it, it, it's it, that's that's a fact of just human existence or before guns the the spear or the bow whatever um so you know you think of another one, like being made to go to school okay and this is not a matter of whether you agree with it maybe you think mandatory schooling is good i don't but let's say you think it's good you, but the, you know, if you, even if you think it's good, the fact is that if you don't go to school as the state requires, bad stuff will be done to you and your parents, right? At least in theory. Now, there's a, I guess this may be a bad example because compliance for going to school is so high um, that it's typically not, it, 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 it's so rare that you get people who just don't go to school that it's not really strongly enforced in practice, fair enough. But the thing is, if enough people decided that school was for them, the, the you'd start getting more regular enforcement, right? And you certainly start to see cops dragging kids and or their parents to prison and, or, and boarding schools, right? Um, and of course, if, and if they resist being dragged to prison or boarding schools, they'd get capped um, for resisting arrest. And um, paying taxes, going to school, serving on a jury, right? That is all submission to violence. It sounds more dramatic than it than it really is. I mean, that's just a reality. It's just a basic reality of human existence. But yes, in practice, you know, it's usually not worth it for the state to send gunmen to get you for most things that you do. Like if like if you just don't do jury duty, uh, and I know people who just don't who they hate jury duty. I love jury duty, <laughs> but but some people they hate jury duty. This the state doesn't do anything to them. The state. It's not worth the resources of the state to go after people who who skip jury duty. Um, but the thing is, they can. If if they really wanted to, if they really cared, they could ultimately start in you know, di you know, being more of a dick and enforcing jury duty, and that would ultimately end with you with people being capped if they if they fully resist if they if they resist to the end, you know, it, it, it ends with, it, it ends with a bullet in your head. Resistance to the state ends with a bullet to your head. Um, and, and that's the reality of the life of, of, a, of a citizen or subject or whatever you want to call it in a state. But how different is that really from a treaty forced by one state on another, right? 
Like, how different is that really? Like, say, like, vassalage of a state to another state. Vassalage of the citizen within it. What is a citizen? It's like a one-man vassal. Right? Or let's, or, uh, tribute. Like, like the, the horde governments would, would demand tribute from other states. Even the United States kind of basically does that by, by forcing the dollar as the reserve currency. That functions as a as a kind of tribute from Europe to the United States, also from like Saudi Arabia to the United States. And when Saddam was was going off the dollar, I think that was one of the reasons he was invaded. I don't think it's the only reason. the The petrodollar. I think there, I think the invasion of Iraq. There are a whole bunch of reasons, but the petrodollar was a reason. I, I, I see people. A lot of people try to poo poo the petrodollar argument for the invasion of Iraq by bringing up other reasons, but that. But that's obviously fallacious, because, yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't have to be the the reason. It could just be a reason. Um, but yeah, but, but what that, but by forcing governments to hold dollars as the reserve currency, that's a form of tribute from from other states to the United States. So basically, the U.S. is exacting tribute from these other countries, and they're using that tribute to build up the military. Um, so yeah, so so the United States is, has a situation that's kind of similar to, you know, the um, the the Mongol Tatar hordes, is that they're is that they're using tribute from other states to to fund uh, a, a large standing army, um, which sounds kind of cool until you realize that that the United States is is totally gay, <laughs> that that the religion of the United States is is like uh, black men and butt sex. So, um, yeah. Now, and the thing is, like, this would be true, like, like, even if there were no cops, like, property rights would be maintained by fear of direct action from citizens. You know, personally, this is another thing. This may be a topic for an another stream, is why... Like is is my view on cops and how cops? It's not a, it's not a clear cut thing whether the the existence of cops either increases crime or reduces crime. Because as soon as you have cops, the you know once like if you go from an area that has no cops, all protection and all like enforcement of any any conception of law, you know either either formal written down law or sort of informal. You know, like caveman law, or just you know, there, there's kind of like an in like a, a natural law among humans. Like there is natural law, like the idea of ownership, the idea of homesteading. Like these are sort of natural evolutionary conceptions that humans have had. Like active use ownership of land is sort of like innate in humans. Um, but but anyway, so if you didn't have cops, you would ha you would have like all sorts of local enforcement of law, right? And you pr also probably have a lot more diversity of law. Um, but as soon as you bring in cops, now you have basically, now anyone who tries to enforce law, now they become a criminal, right? So, so, so basically when cops enter an area, they basically destroy sort of grassroots law enforcement. They, they basically eradicate it in a stroke. All right. It's possible that having like a like a professional uh, police force will be more effective than local law enforcement. That, that's possible, right? But but see, that's like an empirical question. The worst thing that can happen is if you have a police force that is that that is big enough to to deal with um, local enforcement of law, to suppress local enforcement of law, but not big enough or not given enough authority to really go after the criminals, right? That's the worst outcome. Because let's say you own a store. Like I've seen videos of like, of like black guys, not, 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 not always black guys, but usually black guys will go into store and they'll just start like taking stuff or they'll just start knocking stuff down. If you didn't have cops, that guy would just get capped right then and there. Right. You know, and, and nobody would, you know, he, he would just, he, he would just be killed. 
right? That behavior, like if, if anyone tried to behave that way, he would just be killed right then and there, right? Because that's what, I mean, that that's always been true in the past. Whenever you have a marketplace and someone's, you know, steals anything, they, you know, very famously it was common in the Arab world for them to just cut off your hand. Um, and if you were, and if you did, and if you were behaving worse than that, like these blacks in these stores were behaving, you know, they'll probably cap you. And there's and local law, based on previous examples of local law, you get killed for for behaving that way. But you can't do that now, right? Because if you kill a, a black person or you kill anybody for for just just going through your store and just like ripping off all the all the products and and just trashing your store if you try to do that if you try to kill them the cops are going to be on your ass right so the cops make it so you can't deal with it <laughs> like i mean you could try to call the cops and maybe in like eight minutes they'll be there and maybe later they'll they'll track down and find the guy maybe probably not so anyway that's my view on cops um what was I talking about? I went off on a tangent on cops. So, um, okay. Um, so I, I'm sorry if I'm sort of repeating myself, but like, like given our situation, you know, like we are quote unquote, we are dissidents, but like, if I may be so brash, we're not, like, we don't have the arguments, we don't have the right arguments for a dissident, I guess, movement, if I could be so grandiose. Um, so first off, like I've said this a whole bunch of times before, I'll just, like, terms left wing and right wing, they're a losing frame. Because what that does is it makes it seem like there are two teams on a field fighting each other, like two you know, maybe not totally evenly matched, but fairly evenly matched teams fighting each other, right? That's not the situation at all. Not at all. And saying such things makes it seem like, quote unquote, both sides are like equally fair targets. Um, let's say, for example, charges of hypocrisy. The thing is, there is a singular unifying shit lib narrative. This is actually sort of the tr a tr uh, an amazing trick that they pulled. Um, is that basically the, the whole shit lib movement? It's it's an open or it's it's they, they've managed to gain the defensive advantages of an open order movement, but the offensive control of a closed order movement. Right? If you want a clear if you want an example of that, look at Ukraine. Look at how quickly they managed to get like everyone to be lockstep anti anti Russia and pro Ukraine just so fast. I mean that is that is that that is closed order levels of control and yet if you try to attack the systems of control you know shitlibs will go oh you're attacking science itself you're not attacking a particular religion even though it has the same level of closed order control as as a as a uh, as a closed order religion like objectivism or marxism they've managed to sort of pull the wool over everyone's eyes that they're not a closed order religion that they're open order they're not. They're not a. They're not a. Uh, a religion. They're just science itself. It's actually kind of impressive, you know, from from a from a propaganda tactic standpoint. You know, and it would be cool if it weren't so gay. Um. So, but the thing is, like, for charges of hypocrisy, there is in fact a unifying shit lib narrative. Right, they are a thing, you know. And at every place and time, there's a hegemonic religion and degrees of alignment to that hegemonic religion, right? So if you're not aligned to the hegemonic religion, that can be a function of being aligned to some other non-hegemonic religion. Like here on Cozy, that's Christianity, right? In particular, the Catholic flavor, um, or another theistic or another non-theistic religion would be uh, like libertarianism, right? You, so you could be aligned to a minor religion, a non-hegemonic religion, like a theistic one, or not particularly aligned to anything at all, like nothing in particular. 
Um, but however it is that ends, you end up being not particularly aligned with the hegemonic religion at your place in time, either because you subscribe to something else or you're not subscribed to anything. And that is why like amongst conservatives, but th like that's why there's more diversity among quote unquote conservatives, because all conservative really means is non aligned is that you're not aligned with the hegemonic cult. Um, and that's why you have like atheist conservatives, right? <laughs> um, so the, the thing is, there's no conservative religion in the way that there is a shit lib religion, right? Shit libery is coherent. Now, it's not coherent as in being correct or even sensible, right? It's coherent in terms of being totalistic. Right? It's a system that makes sense if if all of its propositions are true. Right? It's internally consistent-ish. Right? Not completely, but fairly, like enough. Like like 80% internally consistent if all of its propositions are true, which they're not. Um now back in the 2010s, like anti-theism was like uh you know, and a big growing booming thing. And the anti-theist movement, unfortunately, unfortunately, I hate to say it. I hate to say it because I don't know if I don't know how many old heads there are here who remember back in the days when I was like just when when, when I was going up against like the atheist community and, and and saying just how stupid they were and how how stupid they were for focusing on 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 theistic religion i didn't i didn't i just called it religion back then but i was basically making kind of the same arguments i'm making now um just with less uh linguistic discipline and so i so i have no love of these people at all right i i i have no love of most atheists i would like most people who are atheists, I would, I would, um, I, I would, I would play Minecraft with them, um, if I could get away with it. But unfortunately, and so, and so, I hate to say this, but the the way atheism gained ground is the model for quote unquote us right it's it's the anti-theist model except we don't limit it to anti-theism right because it has to be opposition to all religion theistic and secular and and making it clear that that distinction is not a meaningful distinction that the distinction between theistic and secular that's just like a modern made-up thing right you know, back at the time, you would have non-theistic religions right next to theistic ones, Buddhism and Taoism, and likely many others. If Marxism existed in like 500 AD, it would be recognized in all the historical atlases as just another religion. Marx, if Marxism existed in 500 AD, it would be called. It would be just straight up called a religion, and it would be be, be put on the same list right next to you know, Hinduism and Islam and Christianity. It would be seen as no different, right? Except like with with a little asterisk next to it that it's non-theistic, okay? So, so, but, so why would we do that? Why would we act any different today, right? All that's happening today is that we're having non-theistic religions. Um, so, like okay, so the success of the atheist movement, it's proven. Uh, let me let me find a thing. I have like a little thing, and this is uh, unfortunate because most people become atheists, become horrible. That is true. Uh, is this it? No, it's not. Why is it not? Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so yeah, you've all seen things like this before. Church membership below 50%. Membership synagogues, mosques, it's going down 60%. And this, I think, this understates it because this is this is just not the nominal decline. But the decline in fervor, as, as you all know, is greater than this. You know, millennials, 51%, 36%, you know. Uh, change in percentage of U.S. with no religious affiliation, 31% among millennials. Gen Z is probably going to be even less. Right. So how how did that happen? How did that happen? Like, going back to open order versus closed order, today for the time being, open order wins. And what has made shit library so successful is that it is actually that despite being actually extremely lockstep, it's it's actually like an extremely lockstep closed order movement. It has been able to present itself as open order, right? Now, in my opinion, modern like this modern shit lib Borg thing, it's functionally more closed order than Marxism is, right? That is, I think there's less diversity of thought. Amongst modern shit libs than there were than there was among Marxists, even though it's portrayed as just a bunch of people independently coming to a certain set of conclusions because they're smart or something, right? Right. So they'll they'll bring up that like oh all the people from the Truth Towers, you know they they promote uh the the they promote shit liberty and they get it backwards right? They go oh people from all the Truth ta Towers they're all quote unquote liberals right? And so that must mean that that this doctrine that's just sort of existed in the sky beforehand came to the Truth Towers, when in reality it was generated by the people in the Truth Towers, right? It comes out from the Truth Towers, right? It's not, so like, like it, it's tautological to say people from universities are going to be shitlibs. That, that's as tautological as saying people from the cathedral schools are going to be Christians, right? It's as meaningless as that. Um, like it's, it's true, but it's like, yeah, of course. Right. Cause that's, cause, cause the truth towers is where religion comes from. Yes, of course. You know, that, that's not, that's not a point for anything. It's not a point that it's like, that's more likely to be true. That is a point that's more likely to be false because everything that comes from truth towers ends up being bullshit. It, it, it always ends up being wrong. Um, cause certainly like, even if you're a Christian, you have to admit most theistic religions are wrong because most people on the planet are not Christians, and so they believe the wrong wrong religion, so they're all wrong, right? I'm I'm just extending that argument further. I'm extending that argument to non-theistic religions as well. Basically, you know, one of the arguments that the atheists made, and you know, there's a few people who still argue atheism on the internet. They're they're kind of laughed at at this point. Um, is that, oh, you believe this religion, well, what about all the other religions? Are they all wrong? So basically, most theists have to be wrong, right, if, if anyone is right. Even if one is right, most have to be wrong. And that's the same thing that's true for non-theistic religions. I'm just applying that argument to the non-theistic space, you know? Like, oh, your theistic religion at your place in time in history just happens to be the one that's correct. Of course, Marxism was wrong, objectivism is wrong, libertarianism is wrong, all the other informal religions, like sort of um, like American, like 1950s Americanism, like sort of a set of ideas that people at that place in time had, the sort of informal secular religion there, that was wrong, right? The sort of, you know, informal secular religion of, of, uh, of uh, Prussia, that was wrong. Like everything else was wrong, but, but you happen, this is the one time that it's right. Right? And so I'm basically extending that argument into the uh, secular religious space. Um, but uh, yeah, so like back in the in the status in the anti-status days, as I call it, I I, I stopped because because one thing when I was in like the quote unquote anarchist spheres is there are all these arguments as to what anarchism is. Like, like, you know, 
like first like you had the big government anarchists like Bausch, um who for whom anarchi anarchism just meant like government control of everything that's anarchism um so so you had the big government anarchists and then you had like the the, the market anarchists and, and the, they were more agreeable but even some of them were saying that i'm not a real anarchist because i was saying that like oh in a stateless society yeah you'll have to pay taxes it won't it won't be to a centralized uh, authority but you still have to pay for things like military and law and, and property enforcement right unless you want to try to enforce property yourself um so so i just i just i just get said oh, i'm just gonna call myself an anti-statist i'm i'm done like i don't Archon, what's an archon? Like, okay, whatever. I'm just gonna call myself. So anyway, back in the anti-statist days, um, which you know I haven't really gone back on as much as I have just sort of abandoned talking about it. And sort of when I talk about these things, you, you can sort of see that I they still, I still largely believe what I believed then. I just it's just not a focus anymore. Um, but like. What I would say then was that I considered anti-statism to be political atheism back then. Now, obviously the term political atheism, I don't like that terminology because obviously it's not political atheism. It's, it's anti-secular religion, you know? Um, so I didn't, I was, so I was, I, I had the wrong language, but I was also wrong because like a lot of anti-statists, they have their own, you know, like a lot of market anarchisms have sort of the emotional arc of a religion, of a heaven and hell, and the inevitability of, of the, the market anarchist paradise at the end of the tunnel and all that. Um, but I think I was sort of on the right track there. See that, that like there's a problem in me and in others, and it's greater religiosity inherent in me. Um, so there's there's so like I have a higher inherent latent religiosity, and this was and is a problem with the whole atheist movement. Is that once you get rid of God, that doesn't actually solve the problem. It only solves the symptom of the problem. Right? Theism is just a symptom of religious feeling. Like one thing I, I said back then is that, okay, God is dead, but the music's still playing. And so I've come to the conclusion that right now we, whoever it is we are, need to be focusing on deconstruction, not advancing a positive vision, right? That is, that is we need to develop, move away from a culture of, of positive uh, advocacy to a culture of critique. Because pure deconstruction can't be counterattacked. Um, you can always attack the messenger, but the, but you can't attack the doctrine, the positive doctrine, because there's no doctrine, right? At most, like in the real world situation, if I'm talking to another person, they can accuse me of personally having like the same religious feeling that I am attempting, however successfully or unsuccessfully, to deconstruct. And that's not good, but it that localizes it on me or whoever's advocating it's localizing it to the messenger um because what i'm promoting is a kind of deconstruction my message is one of negation i'm not telling i'm telling people what not to believe in the same way atheists tell theists to not believe in god i mean they do some bullshit like oh but you are free but you know well yeah, the, atheists are basically telling theists to not believe in god right it's 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 a negation um but they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily go beyond that. Of course, the problem, as, as we now see, is that functionally, practically speaking, they did go beyond that, right? Replacing a theistic religion with a secular religion. Now, being purely about deconstruction is, in my opinion, it's the correct thing to do for several reasons. One, it's actually the most honest, right? at least for me, because I am, in fact, more motivated by what I am opposed to than what I am for, at least at this point. And I think m most people here are, it's kind of a dirty thing to say that you're motivated by what you hate as opposed to what you're for. And okay, I mean, whatever. <laughs> but I, I think it's literally true. Like we're up against anti-white laws 
and the underlying narratives that back them up, you know, and how race hate is used. To, and also like how race hate is used to divert like would be labor socialists from economic concerns, like the undermining of the Occupy Wall Street movement basically converted a whole bunch of what were basically labor socialists, anti-capitalists into just being anti-white and giving Google whatever they want. Um, second thing, the second reason is that it's, And this is kind of a, a two point in one. It's morally correct because I, I think it's immoral to needle someone out of power for what they would do in power. Okay, and a way to illustrate this, imagine that you were trying to propose grocery stores to people who had never seen a grocery store, right? For them, all food was centrally grown and distributed by the state. Imagine trying to tell them that there will be these stores here, kind of like stores where you buy, you know, clothes or anything else, except that's except you can buy food there. And those stores, they can buy food from whatever farms or food conglomerates, whatever that they want to buy, and they can then sell it to you at you know, whatever prices they choose, just like any store. Now, you know, they can set their prices to whatever they want, just like any other store can for food, right? So like, like a critical basic need can be done by these stores, these grocery stores that operate in a market, right? And, you know, you, you can just imagine the flood of, of critiques of this, right? Would rich people buy up all the food? Would food exist in rural areas? Might some people find it impossible to get food if they live in too remote of an area? Will poor people be able to afford food at all? You know, will food producers just find it more profitable to only produce food for the super rich, right? It's all, you know. And if grocery stores didn't actually exist and you couldn't see that they worked, trying to make a theoretical defense of grocery stores against committed critics would be impossible. There are so many holes in, in the idea of grocery stores in a theoretic. If you, if you don't have the empirical reality that, you know, they just work, they just work, um, you know, trying to defend it on like sort of a theoretical ba basis. No way. There's, there's no way. There's no way you'd be able to do it. Right, you you'd completely fail. You'd be you'd be totally you'd be refuted and debunked. You know, every which way, right? You would be flooded in debunkings. You know, Rational Wiki would have a page on like insane, crazy libertarians who want to privatize food production and distribution, right? You know, and that's kind of what it's like. You know defending a a positive proposal when you're out of power right um because the re because all these potent like let me put it this way um when you're out of power everything is speculative and nothing gets collapsed into reality right so let's say you have a proposal and let's say your proposal has uh, 10 points. You have 10 points in your proposal. Your proposal is 10 discrete things. And each of those point, e each one of those 10 points has three things that could go wrong. Each has a 5% probability. When it's all speculative, you don't know which, which point is going to have one of its three things that could go wrong actually go wrong. So when you're defending a position in theory, you end up having to defend against any and all potential bad things that could happen with your plan because none of it is implemented. And so none of these potentialities have been collapsed, right? I mean, how would the, how would the roads manage, you know, the shipment of food to, to the grocery stores? Would, would uh, trucking cartels, you know, just decide not to ship food to certain areas, you know, it's, you know, there's so many moving parts in a, in a, in a grocery store operation, right? There's so many things that could potentially go wrong that could make grocery stores possibly not be a viable uh, system. 
right? If you're having to defend it in theory. Now, in reality, these, these potentialities all get collapsed, right? We don't have to deal with possibilities because we know what it is because grocery stores are everywhere and we know exactly how they work. And we know exactly what problems there sometimes are and how to deal with those problems. So the potentialities get collapsed in a real thing. And so it's a lot easier to defend a real thing than a thing that doesn't exist. Because the thing that doesn't exist, you have to defend all sorts of speculative things that could go wrong. And that's why it's not fair to demand a positive proposal from somebody who has no implementation of what they want. Right? It's, yeah. So, um, all right. And so, it, it, so yeah, it's kind of an, an argumentative, argumentative dead end. Um, on top of that, and I guess this is kind of a separate point, is that if you're out of power, you don't have the manpower necessary to fabricate the research needed to justify in the minds of idiots that your plan will work. Because this is how the minds of idiots work. They look at, you know, how much how much research is on your side. And, and they don't look at it in terms of like the way I me or Sean does research where we actually read the studies and look at like discrete arguments in a very sort of minute sort of way. Um, they look at it in terms of like sort of like the volume of, of research and like head, and, and headline stuff. Um, and like research is mostly used to push things that the researchers themselves have decided in advance to be true. Like researchers decide, I want to, to I like, I support this point. So I'm going to do a study to show this. And, and they do. You know, you can find ways, you can tweak variables, you can tweak exclusion criteria, and you can get any result you want on a very superficial level. Now, anyone who does any digging can go dig and say, oh, that, you know, you did a whole, but you did a lot of stupid tricks here. Your study is worthless, but most people aren't going to see those tricks and, and, and amoral political actors don't care. Right. So, um, so that's what most research is. From an argumentative standpoint, if you're out of power, you don't have the research muscle to prop to, to to do that. You don't you don't have the research muscle to fabricate research to fabricate the the, the results that you need to um to persuade the masses of your position to, to basically fake a bunch of research for whatever it is you want. Um, your opponents have all the research muscle, so they can just create research to say that you're wrong about everything about, you know, how the Wright brothers are full of shit and, you know, um, heavier-than-air aircraft is, is a pipe dream. Only balloons will be able to fly, right? Um, so, so the problem is that, as a dissident, on the one hand, more is demanded from you because um, more is demanded from you if you have a dissident positive proposal because you have to defend things theoretically. So you have to, so nothing is collapsed into reality. You have to defend e against everything that could possibly go wrong. One. And two, you have fewer resources by which to meet those demands precisely because you are a dissident. So it's a mugs game. So you shouldn't play that game. You shouldn't be sucked into defending a positive proposal if you're a dissident. The people in power should be having to do that. Right, their stuff is actually there. Like they're they're the ones who should be subject to critique, not the people without power. That's that's insane. That's ridiculous. Right? right? Why why are you yeah, so just it's it's bad across the board. And and another thing, this is the last reason why um pushing positive proposals is not good, is that it's a strategic dead end. Um when you start pushing positive proposals, you begin to limit the people who good who could be in your thing from the start for no meaningful gain, right? Because pushing positive proposals as a dissident is already sort of not going to work because you have to defend, you know, theoretical objections because nothing gets collapsed in reality, and you have less research muscle to, to fabricate the research to do so. Your enemies can fabricate way more. Um, so. So there's no, there's no, so it's, there's no meaningful end for a positive proposal, but you also start excluding potential people who, on your side, um, like any vision of society, say a libertarian society, for example, if, if you push for a positive libertarian vision, you're going to start cleaving off non-libertarians and you're going to start by varying degrees, you'll even cleave off some 
some of the more puritanical libertarians, like like the, the ANCAPs or whatever, right? Thus, the very stuff that is the most actionable here and now, which is critique of the existing system, that's limited in how many people can be involved in that family of critique. Like Randian objectivism. Randian objectivism has a positive vision of society. But there's also a, an objectivist family of critique. Now, why do most people dismiss objectivism? Now, some of it's ad hominem. It's like, oh, Randian objectivism is only read by like, you know, neckbeards or whatever. But, but aside from that, they people tend not to dismiss Randian objectivism because of their critiques of the system, but because of Rand's positive proposals of what society should look like. That's what keeps people. And, and so Rand's positive proposals, not, you know, not Rand Paul, Ayn Rand, prevents people from listening to her critiques, right? The positive proposal is what is easiest to attack in Randian objectivism, and it alienates people who might otherwise find the objectivist family of critique somewhat compelling, or at least pieces of it compelling. And what I'm saying, you know, I said this before, we need less of a culture of positive vision. We need more of a culture of critique. And I think I've laid out the reasons for it. Okay, so that's why we should be focused on critique as... Um, and as little as practicable on positive vision. Now I'm going to, immediately after saying that, immediately after shitting on positive vision, um, I'm going to, I'm now, immediately after doing all that, I'm going to say two positive things that should be, should be pushed. Right after shitting on positive proposals, I'm going to say two positive proposals we should do. Um, so right now, there's a great opportunity to seize two things that have kind of been left on the ground. Um, and those two things are labor socialism and anti-war. And I, and I say labor socialism because when people say socialism, that can be, oh, so you mean Karl Marx? Like, no, I don't mean Karl Marx. I just mean unions. I don't mean some, some like, stupid theory of surplus value. I just mean, like, hey, boss seems to be screwing me over. You know it when you see it. Labor should organize. That's it. That's all I'm saying. I'm not... I'm not, I'm not hidebound to any particular doctrine of what is or isn't exploitation. That's stupid. Um, so that's labor socialism and anti-war. So now labor socialism being left on the ground, that's actually kind of an interesting phenomenon how that happened. And it's a result, and it's actually a result of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, so you had the, the Occupy Wall Street movement, and in response to that, I'm sure a lot of you people have seen the charts, is that there was a full sort of system press for anti-white narratives and what that did and it worked it worked this worked as a way to divert those would-be labor socialists from the from the occupy wall street movement away from working class politics because working class that actually challenges the system that actually cuts into profits and stuff um that got them to instead of doing that to, to run on the treadmill against you know White supremacists, while simul and what, another thing that was that was amazing about this is that the is that the, first they diverted them away from attacking Google to attacking you know rural whites, um, while simultaneously supporting a globalized labor market. And a globalized labor market is great for capital because what's the what, what is is the the problem? What, what what does what does like business tend to fear? It fears organized labor right and the and the problem of organized labor has always been organization or lack thereof right basically labor is hard to organize when it organize when it organizes effectively it basically always wins and it loses through lack of organization that's always been the dynamic right capital is always more organized but if labor is ever organized enough it always wins and a globalized labor market what that basically means that in any area of the planet, any area of the planet, if labor organizes anywhere on the planet, then businesses can just start shipping in scabs from anywhere on the planet. Infinite scabs. 
right? Like open borders means infinite scabs, right? I mean, it, it, and it ties in so well with, you know, the, 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 the diversion of the Occupy Wall Street movement into anti-white politics and then supporting infinite scabs. It's, it's genius, really. Um, so anyway, because of this, shit libs have put labor socialist issues on the back burner versus, you know, I mean, global warming a little bit, but that's less of a thing than it was in the past. I think largely because like the longer global warming goes on, it's going to get, you know, more and more people are going to sort of quietly stop focusing on it because none of the predictions could ever come to pass. Um, but really it's an anti-white politics. But the thing is they have kind of put labor socialist issues on the back burner. And why did they put labor socialists on the back burner? Because they were told by capital. Not directly. It wasn't Google coming up to them and saying, hey, don't do that. Um, cause, because that wouldn't work because it's obviously Google saying that. No, the New York Times said that. The Washington Post said that, right? All these, these capital-owned newspapers said that, right? Um, now, here's something that I was thinking. If we, if, if we want to get really devious, like one thing I think that could be possible, and this would take some time. This is not something you can just flip a switch and do. I think it may be possible to actually freeze shit libs out of labor socialist concerns for the foreseeable future and basically like completely command the issue, right? And, and, and leaving them at least making it very difficult for them to come back in. And the way you do that is by crafting a narrative that casts labor socialist policies of the past as being a, a, as being white entitlement, right? It, it, it requires some controlled opposition. It requires basically a bunch of people posing as shit libs, going on Twitter and Tumblr, building up following among shit libs, and then pushing the narrative that the old, that basically union organization is a form of white entitlement, right? And arguing, arguing in favor of the third world, right? So turning labor socialism into... Uh, sort of a, either at least a legacy white issue, but also like a, a privilege issue. Um, and and I think the capitalist class would absolutely subscribe to it. Like the elites would subscribe to it because they hate labor socialism. And anything that hardens uh, opposition to labor socialism, that would be good for them. Um, and this would definitely harden opposition to labor socialism among you know the, the 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 malleable people who who do what the New York Times tells them and thinks what the New York Times tells them to think, right? Those kinds of people who are malleable to that would now be, for a much longer term, hardened against kind of ever going back to labor socialism. To say that Occupy Wall Street was like a white entitlement movement. Um, so and everyone else, but the thing is, everyone else now. If you care about workers' rights and being able to, you know, afford life, being able to afford a house, being able to afford a family, well, now the shitlibs have distanced them themselves from that because that's white entitlement, right? I think this could work because shitlibs have proven themselves willing to make um, non, like, non-strategic moves, like the tranny, the, 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 the tranny movement. Even if trannies eventually become um, accepted, that's not an issue that's really worth the squeeze for shit lips. But they did it anyway because they, they it's sort of an uncontrolled mania. They're not, they're not a completely rational uh, uh, movement. They're not a completely rational religion. So, so I think, I, I think that could work. I think, you know, uh, a controlled op where you paint labor socialism as white entitlement to get shit libs to sort of be permanently hardened against labor socialism, that could work and that could keep it for quote unquote us for quite a while. Um, I mean, nothing is forever, but and so, yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, another thing would be like painting the USSR as a white supremacist state, which they're already kind of doing themselves, right? Labor socialism as a form of white entitlement. Um, yeah. 
So, uh, you know, and, and the coup de grace would be if you started to get shit libs to say things like, the idea that you have a right to a certain standard of living that the boomers had, that's a form of white entitlement. The, the standard of living that the boomers had, that was built off of the back of an exploitation of blah, 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 right? Um, you know what they would say. They're pretty easy to emulate in, in, in your mind. Um, so, uh, so that's that. Another, and so the second thing, though, is anti-war. And I think a lot of people have forgot, like, I think a lot of people have forgotten how horrific uh, war is. Right, too many, too many video games, too many superhero movies, um, and not enough fights in school. Um, shit libs, I think, are you know they're increasingly just a pawn of, of the capitalist class, which has caused them to support NATO warmongering in Syria and now in Ukraine. And the way they, and and the way to do this would be, in my opinion, to throw down the continent because this because this all goes back to the to the Munich myth. Can't let Saddam have Kuwait, because that's the thin end of the wedge. Can't let Putin have Donetsk and Luhansk. That's the thin end of the wedge. Give them an inch, they'll take a mile. It all goes back to the Munich myth, and the myth that that the Munich Agreement led to Hitler invading Chechi or something. Right. The Munich myth. Right. Which is, is a complete lie. I've been over in, in a previous long stream on that. Um, and basically, and this is just actually true, that being anti-war means 90% of the time today being anti-NATO. Practically speaking, that's what it means today. It means being anti-NATO. To be anti-war, you have to be anti the war moms, right? That means being like anti, that kind of, you know, America first. <laughs> this means being anti-American, right? It means you're going to have to tolerate things like short wars where non-NATO actors gain ground at the expense of other states, right? Because a thing like, like the Donetsk and Luhansk and Crimea, like in a time before NATO insanity, that would have been just a quick land grab and that would have been it, all right? It wouldn't, it, it, I, I, and see, I've been over that. I've, I've been over how like land grabs almost never portend the, the dissolution of, of the state. Of the state that's losing territory, almost never. Okay. That's that's a complete myth. Wasn't even true at Munich, and it certainly wasn't true. I, I can't think of a try. I mean, I'm sure you could probably think of some example, but like, I can't think of an, an example like off the top of my head where that was ever true. Um, it means, for example, letting Saddam control Kuwait, like you know, and all those things. And, and this throws down the gauntlet because what it does, you know, those might be hard pills to swallow for a lot of people. Well, then, okay. If you're not willing to swallow those pills, then shut the fuck up about being anti-war, right? And that's and that's why the, the, the thin end of the wedge, give them an inch, they'll take a while. That ends up, that's the pro-war battle cry. That's the, that's the, you know, eternal war battle cry is thin end of the wedge. So the, you know, and so the idea that to force, so the idea is to force anti-war into an anti-NATO, you know, pro quote unquote appeasement, as they call it, policy. But what that ends up doing is because the anti-war, you know, and this, and this is also just straight up the truth, is that to be anti-war, you have to be tolerant of a lot of states that you may not necessarily like, getting ground at the expense of other states. And and you have to be in favor of that if you really are anti-war. That's just other otherwise you'll you'll have otherwise you'll always have wars over every every land grab. <laughs> so um so and but what that does is that means that to be anti-war you have to swallow a few pills. Now I'm willing to swallow those pills, and I think someone like Nick is is not Nick doesn't have to be forced to swallow those pills. You know, Nick wants to swallow those pills. Nick likes those pills, and what that does is that gives quote unquote us, vaguely broadly speaking, a monopoly on the anti-war position, because we're because, right? 
because shit libs aren't because because if we frame anti-war as that you have to be anti-war you have to support putin basically in in ukraine shit, shit libs are never going to do that shit libs are locked out of the anti-war position entirely because they're not willing to go against nato you know so those are the two things right basically labor socialism and anti-war and i think we basically have those Okay, uh, I've been talking for a while without looking at the at the chat because um, I was all like revved up and energized with what I was saying. So let me. Um... Yeah, I needed to. I need to look at the white power chats. Let me look at the at the white power chats. See if there's any any more. Any any my my welfare chats my welfare. Wow. Okay. There, there's quite quite a few. Um, Name right there. Okay, uh, <clears throat> uh, where are we? Okay, three dollars from Jimmy Two Hats. Did you see the Holocaust historian talk to Mr. Girl? I did not. Mr. Girl did not like the answers he got, and it ended badly. I did not see that. Um, Jimmy Two Hats, if you, uh, Jimmy Two Hats, are you here? If Jimmy Two Hats is here, please link to that. I would like to see that. That would be interesting. Um, I'll try to watch the chat. Um, I don't know if you're still here, if you left, or whatever. But uh, that would be that would be uh, interesting to watch. I would like to watch. In fact, maybe you know, if I if I keep streaming or whatever, I might stream it here. <laughs> yeah. um, or maybe not. Maybe is it is it on a is it on a cozy channel? I don't want to take wait take views away from. These aren't YouTube videos. There's no, there's no views. There's just concurrent views here, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> what am I? I'm still thinking YouTube. Um, anyway, okay. But yeah, thank you, Jimmy. That would be interesting if you could link that. Uh, Three dollars from Posy Pin. IMO Destiny researches around the best public consensus to get the best public opinion. At no point is truth considered. Um, yeah, I mean, like Posy Pin, that is probably true. Um, Destiny would never. Admit to that, right? What do you? I mean, the most he would admit to is he's saying, "Well, the issue is more complicated than you or I would ever know, so we need to, to defer our, we need to defer our thinking to magic science man." And he wouldn't say magic science man; he would say the experts, right? Um, that's basically the game. It's 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 a shell game, right? It's a confidence trick. It's a, um, thank you for the three dollars for Posey Pen. Thank you very much. Uh, ten dollars and ninety-two cents. Just a fanboy on the just a fanboy on the internet. You are 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 making me. I shouldn't say that. What what you're making me? But you may be making me. Um, what do you think is the future of Canada? Probably something very similar to the United States. I don't I don't I don't know so much about Canada. The thing is, I do a lot of. I'm obviously very U.S. focused. Everything I do is is uber U.S. focused. And I just sort of assume that other countries are close-ish to what's going on in the United States. You know, like Europe, the whites tend to be worse than the whites in the U.S., but they have more of them. So as a result, the situations end up being kind of similar between Europe and the U.S., right? Like, U.S. has a lot more brown people, but the whites are better. In Europe, the whites are worse, but they have fewer brown people, you know? So I, I just assume it's going to be kind of the same. The, U the U.S., uh, Europe has been paying tribute to the U.S. in the form of the, of the reserve, of the dollar reserves. Um, so they basically have, have been leached by the U.S. But that money that goes to the U.S. is not, it, it doesn't really help the, the, the population of the U.S. really. It goes sort of to, uh, to, it goes to the U.S. medical system, which is neither a free market or a centrally planned system. It's something horrific and it ends up being the worst of both worlds. You have sort of the iniquity of the market, but but not the efficiency of it, the health system, and of course atrocious military spending for all the for all the foreign adventures that the U.S. likes to get. And so so even though the the U.S. government is like basically has basically tributized Western Europe and Japan, um, in in kind of a sneaky way. The I don't think the average U.S. citizen sees much benefit from it. Um, like if you look at nominal GDP numbers, you go, "Wow, a white person in, in Mississippi, uh, the, the state of Mississippi, is about as wealthy as France, right?" 
I mean, when you when you see that, like if you like when you see numbers like that, where like Mississippi is wealthier than France, like you know something's wrong. You know there's something wrong with the GDP numbers, right? There's something screwy. There's something screwy going on with U.S. GDP where it's not an apples to apples comparison to European GDP. Um. Yeah. Anyways, what I was talking about. Um. Is there hope or are we fucked? I don't. I think there's just as much hope for Canada as the U.S. I don't think there's any more or less. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry, fam. You, you donate so much money, but you ask questions that I don't know thing. I, I don't know stuff about. Oh, username Tristan uh, David Cole Wintle. Thank thank you, uh, Tristan David Cole Wintle. Um, I'm I'm really. I wish. You, um, at the end of this, I'm going to link to the Discord and and I'm let you ask like more questions. The problem is the two questions you asked, one of which is something that I don't like to talk about because it was a personal thing, and the other is about Canada, which I don't talk about that much because I just sort of assume Canada is like, you know, close enough to the U.S. that I don't have to double up on looking into Canada. Anyway, $25 from the Thin Red Line. Thank you for all your work. Thank you very much, Thin Red Line. It's very useful. Um... $2 from Anonymous. Bad approach. People will have a religion of some kind no matter how much you wish they didn't. Um, and $2 from Anonymous. I believe this is the same Anonymous. He says, your approach assumes people are logical beings. You know better than that. Fair enough. Here's what you're... Okay. Okay. I am not assuming that they won't fall into another religion just because you... Let me put it this way. I'm not saying that just because you... De like, let's say we successfully demonize secular religions in the way atheists have not demonized, but because they, they didn't turn them into like, like a Satan figure or something. Um, but basically made uncool and unbelievable theistic religions if we're, if we're able to do that with secular religions. I'm not saying that that is going to remove all religious feelings, but if successful, it will move people away from from like the truth towers. Now, people will still have causes and creeds and stuff. Now, how will that manifest? Hopefully, it will manifest in people looking more towards their own life as a cause or their things much more local to them as a cause. Like they basically, if they if they become much smaller. If they think small, right? Um, because by 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 making secular religions gauche in the way theistic religions have been made gauche, um, that's gonna divert. That's going to divert the religious feeling and the religious energy that people have. And the thing is, I've said that. I've said that all, on on all my streams that people have always had religious energy, and just because you you refute one doctrine doesn't mean that the genetic tendencies that caused them to believe the doctrine in the first place went away. So, like, I've said that all the time. It, now, you're right in that I have... You're right. I have not bothered to consider... I mean, I have thought about it, but I'm not really talking about it here, and I don't really want to, um, about what what would happen theoretically if I won, if quote unquote we won in this in this um, in this culture of critique strategy? Um, the problem, though, the fact that proposing a positive vision as a dissident is so difficult and so counterproductive, in my opinion, moots this. Pro moots this problem basically in order to have any effect you in order to have any effect you have to be purely negative you have to be purely deconstructed you have to you have to be pure deconstruction so basically so basically pure deconstruction is the only path anyway it's possible that that what could come like if secular religions are destroyed that what comes next could be worse. It's possible. It's possible, but the thing is, you know, I'm will I, one. I'm willing to roll the dice on that. Two. P 
pure deconstruction is the only viable strategy anyway. So this problem is mooted based on that. So that that would be my, res my response to Anonymous. Thank you very much for the $4, Anonymous. It's most appreciated. Smithy, thanks for your work. Problem as I see it is we have the knowledge now, genetics, racialism, and physical sciences to break free of the hegemonic cultural stop, but it's an historical first to have that info, let alone use it. Well, there is a first time uh, for for everything, but the thing is, hegemonic cults, well, let me put it this way. The evolution of religion at this point in time in history is faster than it has ever been, right? Because, I mean, you, you went from blacks to gays to, you know, kind of to Hispanics, but that's sort of kind of a, 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 a low-rent version of the black uh, sacred tribulation. Blacks to gays to trannies, and, and we're already seeing the front end of, of the pedophile um, sacred tribulations. So... So thing, so we are in an unpre we are in a time of unprecedented speed. Um, this gets into, into the next thing I want I want to talk about. So I want to get to the super chat, and what what I want to talk talk about next is some some just just some little things that we that that we can do now, my little black angels. We can do now. Posey pin three dollars. You're an anti credentialist. Yes, the truth needs to stand on its own. Absolutely, Posey pin. Thanks for the three dollars. Wow, ten dollars and ninety-two cents from just a fanboy on the internet, Ryan. I love what you do. You're awesome. I I I love um, just a fanboy on the internet. I I love. Thank thank you very much for the ten dollars and ninety-two cents. I I love. Just a fanboy on the internet. I love. Okay, uh, three dollars hater time. I think that shit libs won't fall for the controlled op on legacy labor unions simply because blacks benefit so highly from the protections provided to them by affirmative action hiring government jobs. Um, no, I'm not saying to go against um, affirmative action. They'll never, they'll never back off of, of quote unquote affirm. They'll, they'll never back off on anti-white discrimination. I don't think that could be sold to them. What I am saying is that the. Um, union organization and basically labor restrictions to basically jack up basically ways of of, of jacking up wages um, through basically union and unions unions are basically a kind of labor cartel um, basically I'm saying to get them to be opposed to labor cartels which I'm in favor of I'm a fan I'm not always look some union unions have been shitty unions do bad things unions can be rotten i understand i'm not unconditionally pro union but in principle i am in favor of labor also because i don't think believe that material advancement is really that contingent on um, capital investment as much as it, it's contingent on technological advancement like and let me put it this way Let's, what would be better? Like an economy from the year 1800 that was perfectly optimized, like all the technology that existed in the year 1800 was absolutely, perfectly, totally well implemented. Economies were completely maxed out. You had the maximum possible standard of living that you could possibly, you completely reached what is called your economic possibility frontier. You completely reached the out, absolute outer end of that circle for your economic possibility curve for the year 1800 that would be nothing compared to like even a shittily optimized standard of living in the soviet union why because the soviet union is worlds ahead uh in terms of technology okay so really ec economic advancement is a function of technological advancement okay the efficient application of that technology is is far is is secondary okay and that's why and i know that that labor cartels they reduce the profits from corporations and here's another problem um because we don't have because we don't have capital controls in the us all those profits they tend to get invested in other countries anyway so who cares 
you know, who cares about their profits? Who cares about your stinking profits? Because they're not they're not staying with us. They're going to 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 Durka Durkistan. So now if you had cap now if you had proper capital controls where businesses couldn't just send their money any to the four corners of the globe, right? They had to reinvest in the US. You could have a little bit of an argument against unions because you want to increase profit because then they would be forced to reinvest in the US. But, but practically speaking, be, one, because there's no capital controls, that boots the point. So screw your profits because we're not seeing it um, because there's no capital controls. But even if there are capital controls, like, like it would take a long time for the efficient implementation of existing technology to become more important than the short-term benefits you could get from immediately higher wages, right? Because the thing is, when you when you organize labor, la labor benefits immediately. But the thing, but the problem, but they're benefiting at the expense of eating into sort of the seed corn of capital investment, and that, um, and so that, act, and so yeah, that does reduce the long-term growth that is a product of sort of the implementation of existing technology. But ultimately, long-term economic growth is driven by advances in technology anyway, so who cares? So that's, that's sort of my view on, uh, on that. I, 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 I just went off on another tangent. I'm sorry, hater time. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not saying that, that they would, um, I'm not saying that they would be against uh, the anti-white discrimination in hiring, but that they should be against uh, labor cartels because labor cartels are legacy white privilege or whatever. Okay, anonymous. As an atheist, do you think Christianity is a precursor to liberalism? It's a precursor to, to, to shit liberty in the same way, and I don't want to call it liberalism because and I don't want I don't and I don't want to call them any of their of their self filating self-aggrandizing term. Like I'm a progressive. Like I'm for progress. As opposed to those people who are anti progress. I'm progressive. You're re you know, that's what a childish thing thing. And of course, calling themselves liberals is just it's stupid. It's it muddles the term. Like more people on the planet consider liberals to be like what libertarians are. So I just I, I'm just not gonna call them liberals. So but so I just call them shit libs and and everyone you know what's funny is calling them shit libs, even though it's kind of vulgar, even though it's kind of a vulgar term. It's a it's it's a more understandable term than calling them liberals because when you say liberal, someone from Europe could mean oh you mean what we think of in America as a libertarian, right? So but when I say shit lib, everyone knows what I mean. I mean destiny. I mean Bausch, right? So shit lib is actually a better term. It's it's a more understandable term. It's less vague. You you know what is meant when someone says shit lib, even though it's vulgar. It's actually technically better than liberal. Um, so anyway, uh, do you believe Christianity is a precursor to, to, to liberalism? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a precursor in the same way that all religions are precursors to all religions. It follows the pattern of a religion, heaven, hell, uh, demon figures, sometimes, sometimes a central demon figure like Lucifer or Satan, um, or, or Hitler, um, and so, so, yeah, it's a precursor, but it's a precursor in the same way that all religions are precursors to all religions. They follow, they follow the same sort of same general patterns. They, they tug on the same sort of emotional cords, like love of the underdog, thus leading to sacred tribulations, you know, the, the certainty of, of heaven at the end, right? Um, be it a, be it a non-corporeal heaven, like heaven, or, you know, stateless communism or whatever um and incompatible with hierarchy order authority and nationalism uh that, that's too too varied too varied now it is true that strictly speaking a true bible believer is opposed to nations right like like a, a, a true christian is is anti-nationalist um now in a sense i'm i'm also kind of anti -national. <laughs> to some degree um and if you want to say how dare you okay 
what is the war between Russia and Ukraine over? Is it over race? No. It's over cultural trinkets. It's over Ukrainians thinking that they're different from Russians and vice versa. More so Ukrainians, right? Russians tend to consider themselves more so. Russians tend to consider themselves more as kin of Ukrainians. And the thing is, as, as a pan-European, as, as like, you know, race is my nation, skin is my uniform, you know, screw your cultural trinkets and, and, and whatever the fuck Poland is. Um, like, yeah, Putin is actually, I mean, Putin is not a pan-European. He's not. He's, he's Russian. But Russian nationalism is closer to pan-Europeanism than Ukrainianism, right? Because Ukraine says the nation is just Ukraine. Pan-Russianism is Russia is Russia, also this little thing called Belarus, and Ukraine. So Russianism is actually like a bigger is, is a bigger group. So so as as like like a true white nationalist, like Russianism is not white nationalism, but it's a little bit closer. Right? It's a little less, it's a little less parochial, okay? Um so, but, but, um, but yeah, like, but the thing is, to the extent a religion is totalizing, like, yeah, Marxism is anti-nationalism, but like you saw in, like in the Soviet Union, you saw the same sort of thing that happened in Christianity. Like you have all these people in all these countries that are adopting a religion that supposedly says, you know, screw national identity, but then even though they're all devout Christians, they still keep going to war with one. Right? And in the Soviet Union, you had the same thing. Even though most people are quote-unquote communists, and, and Marx says national identity is, is a false consciousness or whatever, you know, by 1991, you know, these national flag and dirt identities were were still very much alive. So, um, so yeah, it is, but it, 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 it Christianity does, is doesn't completely destroy those things. And now I think shit liberty is being more successful in that regard because I think shit liberty today is more focused. Like communism, for example, the core tenet of, of, of not communism, Marxism, is on sort of the, the oppression formulas and the march towards the stateless communist at the end of the tunnel. That is, that is the core of Marxism. Incidentally, it's also anti-nationalist. Um, Christianity is all about, like, Jesus died for your sins, except Jesus, go to heaven. Catholics will say, no, 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 it's not by Jesus, you have to do certain works or whatever. You know, there's all sorts of arguments about that. But basically, it's about, it's centered, centered around Jesus and doing things to get in heaven, or not doing it. That's what Christianity is centrally about. Incidentally, Christianity is also anti-nationalist. But that's not the, the driving thing of Christianity. With shit liberty, anti-nationalism is more so the driving thing. So shit liberty is, 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 has been much more successful in anti-nationalism. Now, in a way, I'm also sort of anti but Christian, but shit liberty would actually be more opposed to pan-Europeanism than they would be to petty nationalism as I call it, or parochial nationalism. Uh, hierarchy. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time talking to, about a $2 chat. I'm really sorry to people who pay more. Uh, but, but, but yeah, the, the, the femboy um, in Discord, I, you know, you, you have a, a line to me. Uh, incompatible with hierarchy order. No. Shit libs aren't against hierarchy and order and authority. What do you Like the Truth Towers, the universities, they're obsessed with authority. Like, like, they're like, in term, at least in terms of views of knowledge, they they are unbelievably authoritarian. Like, there's nobody more authoritarian than than anarchists. Like, like they are the most pro, like, like people who think all truth comes from the priests. They're like incredibly authoritarian and hierarchical. And order, yeah, truth comes from the truth towers. So no hierarchy, order, and authority. No, these people are far more hierarchical you know, quote unquote order or what they their vision of order and authority than we are. And that's what's weird. Even though people on Cozy don't see those things as bad words, they actually look at those things as being either neutral or vaguely positive words. 
they're less hierarchical and less authoritarian than shit libs who nominally disavow like or not totally disavow but kind of distance themselves from authority and hierarchy even though they are infinitely more authoritarian and hierarchical right than than the way you know less socialized people tend, tend to operate okay um Okay, I, I'm gonna. I spent so much time reading the chats. I need to refresh. Just got any more? Uh, okay, I just got a bunch more. Okay, three dollars from B. Williams. Um, also, positive visions don't seem to unite the dissident right much, and seem to further increase factionalism. I think America should be X. Fuck you. I think America should be why. Should be why. Totally agree. Absolutely agree. Anonymous. Ryan, when will you move to Wyoming? I moved out here recently and I love it. Um, I'm gonna have to move for um because my my cynic here is drying up where I am. But yeah. I, I am actually gonna I'm actually gonna be kind of forced to move. From where I am. Uh, Two dollars from Genocidio. I am from Balkans, and people here are apathetic. They don't believe in anything, any causes at all. And here, I mean about rule of law. Okay, that goes a bit beyond uh, be irreligious. Uh, what, what you're talking about? I mean against rule of law, meritocracy, fairness, appearance, or anything. It's hard for me to think Kazi Westerners are merely insane. Well, it seems to me that you're dealing with a, with people that are like systemically depressed as opposed to as as opposed to non-socialized. Um because unsocialized people, they're not depressed. They just, you know, they're just interested in things other than kind of grand abstract causes. You know, they're they're interested in like their lives. They're interested in, you know, working on their car or or building something cool or you know, the the um it sounds to me like when you talk about Balkan people that they're just kind of depressed, you know, which, which I think I ha I have an idea of why that might be. There seem to be environmental reasons, at least it seems to me from way outside, that there could be environmental reasons for them being depressed. But I I don't I don't want to comment too much. One one thing one thing I noticed talking about Irish politics is that like. I don't know. Made sort of a joke that if you if you're ever like if you ever talk about Irish politics, I think Balkan politics might be the same way. If you ever talk to anybody in the Balkans and you say hello, you've just made ten enemies for life or something. But that may not be. That's obviously an exaggeration. But you know, uh, anonymous is Christianity anti-racist? Yes, not. But the thing is that's. Same with the anti-nationalism. That's not like the core message of Christianity. The core message of Christianity is Jesus died for your sins. And depending on the flavor, you either have to do good things to get into heaven or just accepting Jesus alone is enough. Um, you know, whatever. Um, it, it's, it's, not the, it's not the central thing. I went over that with uh, same, same with Marxism and anti-nationalism. You know, Marxism is like Christianity in that it's anti-nationalist, but that's not the core message of Marxism. The core message of Marxism is centered around labor and exploitation and the march and, and, the, and the inevitable stateless uh, communist society. Would Greco-Roman paganism be preferred according to you and why? Uh, maybe. The thing is, Greco-Roman paganism is kind of is kind of like is kind of um, irreligiosity. Um, because my understanding is that Greco-Roman paganism, but they believed, even though they believed in those gods, they didn't, they didn't ascribe moral authority to those gods. So they still would end up having religions and those religions would be what were called the philosophies. So, um, so would Greco-Roman Greco paganism, like, that's not that important to me because that's not the religion. Right. That that's just a that's just that's just belief in ghosts, basically. That's just belief in spirits and non-corporeal beings. That's not um so basically like so so the, the important corollary to that would be 
what else? <laughs> like, what's okay? Greco, Greco, Greco Rogan paganism, okay, but what's the religion, right? Yeah, depends on the real Greco Rogan pagans, okay, but also Marxists. Um, no, that would that would be worse. <laughs> so anyway, um, okay. So so here's some some things that I want to talk about. I had more energy before I started the stream, but um. So I so I've thought about um, about about what, uh, practical activism, practical practicable activism, um, and here's something that I've thought about. Okay, on YouTube there are a bunch of uh, pirate streams of sporting events, in particular college football. NFL games now they get they get the band hammer way too quickly, but there is a whole bunch of pirate streamed college football games and the channels they actually stay up for quite a while, you know they get taken down eventually but they stay up for quite a while, so now of course it's it's more difficult to make a YouTube channel than it was in the past, you need you need like burn I think you need burner phones at this point, um, but. Now I never had to give Google my my number because my my account is ancient, um, but I think you have to give a number. So so it's, it's going to require burner phones. So because the channel will eventually get taken down if you're posting pirate broadcasts. So but the, but anyway, let me get to it. Now these streams they're pulled from TV broadcasts. What does that mean? It means commercials, and as someone who doesn't watch TV. You know, as as kind of a guilty pleasure, I'll occasionally watch BYU football games. I don't really care much about it, any anyone else. I really don't care that much about BYU because they're not really Mormon anymore. You know, they're letting blacks in. I mean, there's blacks on the football team. Um, but it's whatever. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a cardinal sin. Um, but these broadcasts have a ton of commercials. And nobody likes or cares about commercials. Here's my thinking. Why don't we host these pirate streams, but then run our own commercials? Right? Why don't we, and by me, you know, kind of, kind of, to a large extent, I make a bunch of content to fill out the commercial slots Right then, we set up the pirate streams, and then we basically have those commercials sort of on tap in OBS. And people have to learn about it's not that it's not that complicated. You just have to you just have different media sources. And when a commercial is playing, you just you just overlay, and and set as a higher priority your um your the 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 thing you want to play as the commercial is playing, right? So, you know, and these streams. These pirate streams, they'll they'll pull anywhere from like a thousand to like some of the bigger games, the big SEC games, they'll pull like you know over ten thousand views each live. And what's great about this is that these are the normiest of normies. Like these are people who watch sports ball. This is like as normy as you can get. Right? They, it's not it's not shit libs because shit libs uh, tend not to be that interested in in hand egg. Um, and of course it's not like quote what we. What you, people call the far right, or you know, I hate those term that term, but what people call the far right aren't interested in hand egg because basically at this point it's just a Negro circus, right? So, so the far right's not interested in it. Shit libs aren't interested in it. Who's watching it is like normies, the normiest of the normies watch it. That's perfect. That's great. That's like the target audience, you know. And and it's a great. I think it's as. I don't know. I like the idea. I like the idea of, of, of doing that. So, uh, yeah. Um, I, I set up a, a Discord. I think it's now time to, to link the Discord. Um, uh, I set up a Discord a while ago. It's probably going to have problems because I'm a perma noob. And, um, yeah. But I think it may be time to end the, uh, to, to end the stream, um, and I, uh, it's down at the bottom. If you guys are looking at the bottom of the page, you see uh, my gab, YouTube, BitChute, Odyssey, all these things. I'm gonna put the Discord down there as well. 
No, uh, buying ads on no, I'm not. Don't buy ads. Just, no, let's just stream it ourselves and then put in our own ads, right? Just, and just overlay our own ads in OBS and, and mute it when when stupid like you know Domino's ads are playing. Okay, um, yeah. So that that that's that's that's. I don't know. I think that's great. I think that's a fantastic thing to do. Um, but anyway, also one thing I've been thinking about is uh, I want to set up a Hearts of Iron stream um for uh old world blues people are interested in old world blues I i'd be interested in having a multiplayer old world blues campaign um i'd like one where we're friends it'd be cool to, it'd be cool for if we all played as chapters of the brotherhood of steel we, and we took over and we reunified the continent that'd be, that'd be fun um so um yeah and so if any if so if anyone would be interested in that i've never hosted or even played a multiplayer hoi 4 game so don't don't and max don't don't be an asshole like meta player <laughs> just, just play um but yeah so i have like a, a section on that so if people so if people want to want to talk about that or or say they they want to they any mappies yes mappies if any mappies want to play that uh just pop in the discord which i'm going to post after i um end the stream um it's going to be right down at the bottom so I'll end the stream right now. Do you use place of five? No, I do not. So anyway, 